Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Today we are looking at the Riverlands. Uh, this is the end really of a short series of videos going through the main houses of the Riverlands. We've already looked at a few of them. We looked at House Bracken, we looked at um, the Tullys, we looked at House Frey. This is a chance to pick up some of those houses that we didn't go into huge amounts of detail earlier. House, I've got questions on houses like House um Malister, House Went, uh, House Strong. We can pick up a little bit more about those as well as looking at the Riverlands more in the round. Um, as always, I have some questions from my patrons. As always, I'll try and pick up as many questions from the chat as I can going through. And as always, I'll try to start off with a little bit of an overview, just a bit of a history of uh, the Riverlands, just to place everything into some kind of uh, context for you. The Riverlands, actually, let's start by getting the map up. Uh, that's normally quite helpful. So the Riverlands really is a, um, a a prisoner of its own geography, it has to be said. the What you can see here um, from the map is the Riverlands is the bit in the middle of Westeros. It borders all but one of the Seven Kingdoms. The other one that it doesn't border is Dawn, and it's very close to that as well. I'm playing quite fast and loose with the Iron Islands, but the Iron Islands are right next door as well. So this means that if ever there's any kind of conflict going on that goes beyond the local, the Riverlands often gets caught up. So in the stories, the stories that we read, A Song of Ice and Fire, um, in uh, The Dance of the Dragons, in Aegon's Conquest, it always seems to be that the brunt of the action uh, and the harm falls on the Riverlands. It's not helped by the fact that it's not naturally defendable in as much as uh, the, the Westlands have got a massive mountain range to help them, the Vale of Arindu as well, the North have got the Neck uh, just sort of funneling everyone into one very narrow causeway coming in. Uh, the Riverlands doesn't have that. There's, there's no natural defensive structures there. And there's also no huge cities it has to be said there's a lot of towns it's quite populous um, there's a lot of farming communities there's quite a lot of castles but there are no huge cities uh, so that's a sort of the overview that we have um, the other thing before I get into the history the other thing I would say is that this is as well as often being the center of these conflicts this is often kind of like the center of um, decision, I would say. Um, we get a, a few very key points in Westeros's history come down to what happens in the Riverlands. We have the pact uh, very early on in uh, history, which is signed on the Isle of Faces in the Riverlands. We have uh, quite a lot of the most important decisions in the Targaryen history which take place at Harrenhal. We get the tourney at Harrenhal, we get the Great, great Council, um, and then we have, in a kind of very literary sense, George R. R. Martin likes to use, there's a crossroads. If you have a look at the uh, at this map, there is a crossroads right in the middle of this map, just uh, a little bit sort of north of, uh, of the God's Eye Lake. Um, you have the Inn at the Crossroads, where we have a few chapters based at the Inn of the Crossroads. And this is a decision point uh, that George R. R. Martin has created for us. He can show it, not just in terms of like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to go, but where I'm going to go. But from there, you can go north, south, east, or west. The classic early example of this is Cat. Um, Catelyn Stark in book one, she captures Tyrion at the inn at the crossroads. And what she, what does she do? She's just come from the south and people will be going back down to the south to King's Landing to report on what's happening. She could go west. That takes her to River Run, where she grew up. She could go north. That takes her to Winterfell, where she is now the Lady of Winterfell. Or she could go east to the Eyrie. 
And it's this decision which um, shifts a lot of what happens in that early part of the story. And I suspect we will get, or we probably have a few in the past, uh, decision points there at the end of the crossroads. But also I think um, we will probably get a few more coming up in the future. There was one actually in, in the TV show, which I've no idea whether they will do this or George Martin will do this in the book, but it just felt about right. Arya's there in season seven or whenever it was. Arya comes back into Westeros and she stops at the inn of the crossroads. She meets Hot Pie, if you remember, and she has to decide, does she go south? Her kill list suggests that she should go south. That's where Cersei is. Or should does she go north? That's where her family are gathering now in Winterfell. This is a point of decision for her. So that's the kind of the, the literary space that George R. R. Martin is using here. This is where battles are focused. This is where decisions are made. Uh, this is the heart of Westeros. But obviously, when we're talking about the Riverlands, right, right now, the region is relatively easily um, uh, sort of delineated. If you're looking at this map in front of me, just off the top of this map is the Neck. That's the border with the north, uh, the highest or the, the most northerly uh, castle that we have on there. This is the Twins, which is a relatively recent castle. Um, its border to the east is that range of mountains, the mountains of the moon, uh, which uh, border the Vale of Arryn. To the west, we have the mountains, which are the Westlands, basically. Um, the, the Riverlands are so-called because there are obviously lots of rivers. The three key rivers um, flow into the Trident. Uh, the Red blue and green forks they're called these three rivers which flow into the trident and they they cut this land in half east west because uh, the there is the crossing that the phrase have control of right in the north and then you have to go all the way down uh, to the ruby ford um uh, hundreds of miles south of that if you if you want to cross so the riverlands has this natural barrier that goes it, between it as well and crisscrossing it we often get strategic decisions in these stories made because people have to cross a river and it's hard to cross a river do they uh do they try and wade across do they go where, where do they cross how do they cross we obviously get the example with rob stark who crosses north, uh, the far north with some of his forces uh, at the Twins, has to make a huge amount of promises in order to uh, do that, which will have ramifications later. We also get Tywin, who with his army eventually decides to head west, tries to cross the river, and is actually beaten back by Ed Edmure Tully. Uh, but we get other random examples of when an army or someone tries to cross the river. Um, you get Roose Bolton heading back up north, uh, he gets ambushed. He's probably aware that it's going to happen. He gets ambushed as he is crossing a river and loses a lot of troops. Tragically for him, I'm sure, uh, his own troops, the House Bolton troops and the House Frey troops managed to get across. The ones that were attacked were the Stark loyalists. So the rivers themselves play a huge part here. But let's go back in history. Let's go uh, to the very, the, the Dawn Age, the very beginnings. Uh, humanity comes into Westeros uh, from Essos across that land bridge into Dawn. They head up into uh, the, the Riverlands. And they have this very long battle with the children of the forest which ends with the pact the pact is an agreement between the children of the forest and uh, the first men uh, the children will that they will have their lands their lands being the deep forests uh, their caves things like that and uh, the first men will leave them alone which kind of seeds most of the lands to the humans um, that pact is signed on the Isle of Faces, the island in the middle of the God's Eye Lake, the largest lake in Westeros, slap bang in the middle of this map that we have here. And from that moment on, the Isle of Faces is pretty inaccessible 
there are only two people that we know of who have been to the Isle of Faces. Uh, one of them is Adam Valarion, one of them is Howland Reed. And they both have good stories going on there as to why and how they managed to get there. But the Isle of Faces itself is pretty inaccessible and stays this heart, as far as we can understand it, this heart of the Weirwood Tree Network. Now, the, the, the first men who then populated the Riverlands, as we know it now, it wasn't really called the Riverlands per se right then, uh, they were first men and they took on the religion of the children of the forest. And so they they worshipped the weirwoods and the old gods, and some of them continued up north uh, into the north. And um, over time, a whole load of petty kings grew up. Uh, but from time to time, we would get a few different houses who came to the forefront, uh, who ruled. The the One of the most famous earlier houses who ruled for a thousand years, we're, t we're told, is House Mud, M-U-D-D. -D. Um, they ruled uh, most of what we think of as the Riverlands, the, I think they called it the Rivers and the Hills then. Uh, they've ruled from what is now known um, uh as Old Stones. It wasn't then, incidentally. Uh, Old Stones is a name which is given to the ruin, but when it was the capital of their empire across the Riverlands, it wasn't known as Old Stones. It had a different name, but that name has been lost to time. House Mud ruled for a thousand years uh, or so. Um, after them, after them, though, or the end of their reign, this is when the Andal invasion came. And as we've said, the Andal invasion, we shouldn't really think of it as an invasion. This was a um, a long, very long and slow, violent immigration. It's probably the only way to say it. This took place over hundreds of years. It wasn't just loads of people got in boats and came across in one go. This was over decades, centuries, uh, we'd have boatload after boatload after boatload of Andals from Essos coming over into Westeros. House Mud fought them, um, and their uh, their king at the time, King Christopher IV, it was, we're told that he fought a hundred battles against the Andals, and he won 99 of them. Tragically, he lost the hundredth. And he died. His son, Christopher V, uh, took over, wasn't as successful, and this was the end of House Mud as kings. And what followed then was this series of petty kingdoms across the, uh, the Riverlands. A lot of the houses that we know now were at various times kings. The, the Malisters were at one point kings. The Brackens were at one point kings. The Brackens started up in the north and came down south. Um, uh, sorry, the Blackwoods, that, that is, started in the north, came south. The Brackens also were kings at some point. The Vances were... Um, a lot of them had small kingdoms. Some of them rose to be uh, larger kingdoms. Uh, one which we have a mention of quite significantly is House Justman. The, the original, the first Lord Justman, was actually a bastard child of the, the Brackens and the Blackwoods. He managed to unite. He sounds like he was quite a great guy. We don't have huge amounts of information about him. It sounds like he was quite a force of personality to manage to unite those two houses in some way. He and forged House Justman, and they ruled for 300 years or so. Then we had House Teague. People didn't much like House Teague. Um, uh, the Durandons then came in. The Durandons were down in Storm's End, in the Stormlands, which is... Uh, they were an ancient house. They'd been there a long, long time. They, they are... We, we forget about them a bit because in the story of A Song of Ice and Fire, they've been replaced. They've been replaced by House Baratheon. But they were an ancient and powerful house during this time. They had the kingdom, which they extended out from the Stormlands all the way up into the Riverlands, 
but it, they had a huge amount of rebellions against them. And eventually you get a new invader coming in. And this is the Iron Islanders, House Hor. House Hor came in and forged the kingdom of the Isles and the Rivers. So suddenly we have this new formation where we have the Iron Islands and the Riverlands joined together. House Durandon down in the Stormlands still laid claim to a certain amount uh, of land. There was this area of disputed land between these two empires. The uh, the height of the Kingdom of the Isles and Rivers, House Hor, was Harren the Black, who decided that he was going to rule not from the Iron Islands, but from the middle of the Riverlands in Westeros. And he built in the centre of the Riverlands the biggest castle anywhere. Huge, massive, beyond the wildest dreams of anyone. The, um, the the Great Hall had, I can't remember how many now, 24 fireplaces or something ridiculous. Um, its circumference was many times that of Winterfell. It had a, it had a, a, a godswood bigger than any other elsewhere. Everything was bigger, better, more impressive. And the irony is that he finished that. It took 40 years to build. He finished that the very day that Aegon the Conqueror landed in Westeros to start his conquering, to start his invasion. And when Aegon and his sister wives reached the Riverlands and they they knew they had to face Harren the Black, and Harren decided actually he didn't want to face the dragons in open combat, understandably. He'd got this amazing new castle, which nobody could get into he said okay you you just besiege me if that's what you want to do the river lords themselves had largely turned against uh, a house hall by this point they'd thrown their lot in with the targaryens but Harren the black had managed to get himself in his castle and he felt fu fully safe everything was built there was nothing that could stop him Obviously, there was uh, Valerian the Black Dread, riv ridden by uh, Aegon the Conqueror, rose up, flew around a few times, and then burned the castle. Valerian's flames were so hot that they melted the stone. The huge towers, there are five huge towers there, and the tops of them just got melted. There's a wonderful description if you ever uh, go back to, uh, it'll be in A Clash of Kings, I suspect, uh, Arya when she's there at Harren Hall. She climbs the steps up one of the towers and the, uh, the further up she gets, she sees the stone is kind of warped and almost like it's dripping. And this is what remains of, of Harren Hall's towers. It's just the stone had melted. Anyway, the Targaryens took over. They placed the first major house to uh, to bend the knee to them, House Tully, in charge. They had a, a good castle uh, at Riverrun. They were one of the, the more powerful houses, but probably not the most powerful, certainly not the richest house um, Frey were probably the richest. They had never been kings, unlike, say, the Malisters. Uh, they didn't have the rich history of, say, the Brackens or the uh, the Blackwoods. And so, although they were Lords Paramount of the Riverlands, the other big houses of the Riverlands never really gave... They, they were quarrelsome. They were argumentative. Uh, they were occasionally insubordinate. House Frey were often insubordinate. Um and but they 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 allowed the status quo because we had the targaryens with their immense power the i won't go into all of the the details of um going into the the story as is now uh, we will pick up on a few of these details so i have got a question about harren hall um after that as well if you're wondering about that so we'll pick up on that uh, but that is broadly the the history of the riverlands it, it's not uh 
a self-defined, easily defined area with boundaries that you can clearly tell, like Dawn or the Vale of Arryn or the Iron Islands or something like that. Um, it's not hugely defended. It's not got a history of always having one ruling house or a building up towards having one ruling house, as so many of these other places do. The um, When you go down to, well, you look in uh, the Westlands, the Lannisters have been ruling that for centuries and centuries. And before that, uh, we know who they took it off of as well, the Castellis. Um, this is not the case in the Riverlands. Every few hundred years, the balance of power shifted. Uh, somebody else was in the ascendancy. And this is the story of it uh, going pretty much going through uh, the ages. Um, right, let's have a quick uh, look at... Uh, I'll leave the map up for a little bit, but let's have a quick flick through. I think I had a few questions um, uh, from uh, the uh, in the chat. Let's try and pick them up. If my computer will work. Uh, yep, yeah, here we go. Uh, first of all, Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara. Very generous. Thank you very much. Saying just a show of love, appreciation, and support for all the great content, merch, and stories. Hugs to Dan, your handsome dog. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Cloaked One saying, long time no see. Great to see you, Cloaked One. Uh, hope you and Dan the dog are doing well. We are. Thank you. I can't make it live today, but just popping in to show some appreciation. Also sending strength and good vibes to anyone going through hard times in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, uh, one of the things I think is most wonderful about if you're watching this live um the the chat is incredibly supportive uh so uh don't feel you have to share anything in there but if you are uh, going through tough times right now then yeah please just know you have friends around you smurfy's saying huzzah new stream thank you very much michelle romo um saying i was looking at the map to connect how far apart old stones and high heart are and trying to triangulate where Jenny of Stol uh, Old Stones was from and how she and the ghost of High Heart could have met. I can't figure it out. What do I think? Right, well, I can... Uh, oh, let's see. Can I? I might be able to zoom in. Um, so, uh, if you are looking uh, towards the sort of the top here... Um, you will see the the writing the the northernmost writing just to the right of Iron Man's Bay says Hags Meyer, and just to the south of that you have Old Stones. So that's where Old Stones uh, is. It's one of the more northerly uh, houses or nor northerly castles. Uh, it's north of Riverrun, for example, just south of Seaguard and south of the Twins. Um, High Heart. If you sort of go almost due south from that, um, just sort of like west northwest of the God's Eye Lake, you will find High Heart. Now, what you've got here is a, and I, I've said this many times. I, if if I were clever enough with this, I would have, um, uh, I, I would sort of draw on this map itself. But you have got what remains here of a sort of, um. Uh, a line, an arc of worship of the old gods or old gods related things going into the Riverlands. We often think of the Riverlands as being um, Andal, this there southern, uh, but there is this very clear and strong streak of worship of the old gods here. So, and what I mean by that is if you if you look into this map, we've got um, so let's start at Old Stones. Old Stones clearly is it has this feel of the old gods to it. We have a chapter uh, there, a couple of chapters based there. Um, there's a weirwood tree. This is where Jenny of Old Stones comes from. Um, that this feels like the old gods. You head south from that, you get the Whispering Wood. We think of the Whispering Wood as being the uh, the place which was obviously the place where we get the battle Rob Stark took on Jamie Lannister but if you just stop and think about the name the trees talking whispering wood it feels like um 
the uh the old uh the old gods then you get of high heart um which is where there was this whole clump a circle of weirwood trees they're now chopped down but it's still clearly they have some power going on there then you have um uh, I mean, a little bit further south than that, you've actually got Hollow Hill, which again screams of the uh, the children of the forest. But Stonehenge again sounds very, uh, very old godsy. Raven Tree Hall, we know we were talking about this. This is the home of um, the uh, uh, House uh, Blackwood, and their home has got this um, enormous weirwood tree outside. It's dead, but it's absolutely huge um, that is very much a kind of a home to worship of the old gods then we obviously next to this we have got uh, the isle of faces and the god's eye lake this is the arc that we have of um old old godsy uh, worship going down into the riverlands in fact there's even uh, there's even one of the I think it was I think it was House Teague, um, who I as I said they weren't much liked um, as rulers of the Riverlands. I think it was them who decided that they would get rid of the worship of the old gods, and so and this actually caused an uprising led obviously by House Blackwood, but also a few other houses like House Tully, um, just sort of said no, we're we're not having that. Um, this was this was before the Targaryens. So this is back in time. This was before the Targaryens invaded. There is still a very strong feeling of that is their local culture in that arc that we have there in the Riverlands. What's worth noting, though, is that the North were largely cut off from that. Yes, that they they were aware of it, and certainly when we come into the Targaryen area, they became increasingly aware of it. But the the neck provided such a physical barrier that that part of the Riverlands was cut off from their sort of cultural companions in the north, as it were, for a long, long time. Um, Cole Carsnock, thank you for putting the link in there. Yes, this this map is from Quartermaster.info. Uh, it's I think it's a fantastic, um, uh, fantastic resource. So please get, do uh, support them. Um, let's have a look. So yes, Michelle Raimo, just to pick up on your question, um, trying to triangulate where these two things are, where they could have met. Um, the 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 point there, having gone off on my digression uh, about the sort of the arc of old gods worship, the the point is that uh, the ghost of High Heart was not known as the ghost of High Heart at that moment in time. She was known as the Woods Witch. She was the the friend of Jenny of Oldstones, and the implication is that she hung out at old stones as well so we're not told all the details we just know that she came down with jenny from old stones she became known as the ghost of high heart um later her high level history seems to be she comes down to king's landing with jenny uh, jenny's there marrying uh, duncan targaryen uh, firstborn son of aegon the fifth uh the, the Woods Witch gives her prophecy about where the prince was promised, the line of the prince that was promised. And she was there at Summerhall when Summerhall burned down. And she basically, she seems to have been drunk on grief from that moment. The implication is she stayed there. Her friend Jenny died there. Jenny, you know, Jenny's love uh, also died there, Duncan Targaryen, as did his father, Aegon, as did uh, Dunk, Sir Duncan the Tall, uh, as did many, many other people. Uh, so much death, and this seemed to really affect the Woods Witch, who it seems then hung around there for quite some time, until eventually moving north from there heading north and finding a new home 
around High Heart and becoming known as the Ghost of High Heart. And she was known as the Ghost of High Heart because she had a very ghostly complexion, she had very white skin, and because uh, she just she was very quiet and just sort of appeared, um, and she largely based herself at High Heart. Um, right, a couple more questions. Uh, reflective um, rambling, picking up a question for Agreet Weirwood, uh, saying, when were the bridges at the Twins built, and what did Jeharis do when it comes to the King's Road? Were the bridges uh, there before or after? Yeah, let's go back. So we've got the uh, we've got the map. Uh, Carl Carsnock saying yeah, the maps will be up there. I'm keeping the map up for the time being because I think these are these are worth uh, is worth looking at here. So. Uh, the twins are right right now in the middle of the map. Um, the tw the the let's start with the King's Road first of all. So the King's Road is this road going up, um, sort of north south. It sort of heads southeast a bit towards the bottom of this map, but it's the sort of the green line there that sort of heads north south. It goes up through the neck, which is at the north here. Um, in order to get to the Twins, you have to leave the King's Road, is the, the main point here. The King's Road, for most uh, of its time in the Riverlands, heads alongside the Green Fork River, but here it kind of diverges a bit. The Green Fork River is wide, it is deep, it is fast, it is impossible at this point here to cross it normally. The, the, this, the history of um, House Frey, I did... If you want to go back a few weeks, we did a, the whole live stream about House Frey. But for the sake of this, they started existing, to all intents and purposes, 600 years ago. They were given this bit of land. And the bit of land that was on either side of the Green Fork River here, they tried. They decided to build the bridge. It took them three generations to build it. Um, and then once they built it, after that, they then started building the castles on either side of it. Um, this was 600 years ago, so 300 years before the Targaryens invaded. Um, and it is, uh, it's a strategically important bridge, not because it's on the King's Road, but it's because if you wish to go from the King's Road to anywhere on the west side, then unless you want to go all the way down here, uh, so just near uh, where the Crossroads Inn is here, um, unless you want to go all the way down there, uh, you have to cross up at the Twins. Um, so uh, that allows you to go across to Seaguard, which is the main port in this part of the world. It allows you to head on down to River Run, saving you depending on how fast you're traveling, maybe a week or two of travel. It's quite a significant um, amount of uh, time that you would be saving. Uh, the and, and the other thing, just on the King's Road, it's probably worth noting, that road was there before. What, uh, what Jeharis did was he upgraded it basically uh it was a road it was there but it was a dirt track it was a dirt track that lots of people went down so it wasn't in very good condition uh you get these cart tracks going up and down it there they, they would get big puddles because of the, all the divots uh puzzles uh, puzzles puddles because of all the divots and things like that it wasn't in uh in good condition he basically paved it he turned it into a proper road and not just the King's Road, it's, we call it the King's Road, but he did other roads. So you get the road that goes through from Lannisport up to River Run, across to in at the crossroads, and then basically keeps on going towards the Erie. You get the uh, the Rose Road, the Gold Road. You get a lot of different roads that, roads that um, basically were bank organised and bankrolled by the Iron Throne. Uh, Brian Moore, thank you very much. Um, for the super chat, I didn't see a question attached to that one. Um, the if there is one, then let one of the moderators know, and they'll 
bring it to my attention. Pierre Davis saying missing Lady Went. Yes, yeah, so Lady Went, uh, the the last, well, the the owners of Harren Hall at the start of the story are House Went. The the last of the Wents is Lady Went. She's an old, old lady um, who is in this cavernous castle. She can only take, yeah, she, she uses the bottom third of like a couple of the towers and that's pretty much it. And when bad things start happening and when um, it's very clear that uh, there's going to be a war, big civil war and people are going to be trying to occupy Harren Hall. She basically just gives up and goes away. She cannot defend it. She doesn't have the forces to defend it. Um, yes, it's a massive castle. Uh, it would be incredibly defendable if you had how many thousand people to defend its walls, but she didn't have enough people to be even guarding the walls. So she left and she is missing uh, with reports now that she is dead. Brian Moore saying, no, just showing support. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I think I had yeah, another question. So, uh, Caris Bellarina saying, is the man from House Mud that tries to woo Rhaenyra at Storm's End in House of the Dragon actually Jenny's ancestor or a liar or crazy homeless man living in Old Stones? Um, so, House Mud was destroyed the name mud continued now uh that doesn't necessarily mean that the uh the descendants or the people with that name are the exact descendants of the king there's not doesn't necessarily mean that they're sort of the king uh, or head of house mud house mud was disbanded so they might just be descended from somebody who was attached to house mud or something like that um uh might it be jenny's ancestor possibly um we don't get jenny voldstone's surname we're not told so might the implication this is an argument from silence because we're just simply not told it. Uh, the implication was that she didn't have a surname. Otherwise, we would have been told it. If she had been Jenny Mudd, then I think that we would have been told that that was uh, her name. Uh, Robbie O'B, uh, great to see you, saying, love the new setup with the map and all that. Uh, yeah, it's good. This is, at the moment, the extent of my technological abilities on this one. Um, uh, we can... Uh, Let's let's zoom back out of the map again for a moment. We can uh, we can talk about the map in a little bit, but um, yeah, maybe we'll try and get a little bit more whizzy with the technology in due course. Uh, question from Robbie Ob saying the magic that the children used to create the Riverlands and to break Dawn off from Essos. Do you think this was inspired by the myths around the Giants' Causeway in Ireland? Um, uh, right. Well. The Giant's Causeway in, in Ireland, uh, for those who don't know, I've never been there, um, but it's a um, incredibly beautiful, if you see the picture, somebody in the chat put up a link to pictures of it. Um, it's got these, I think, octagonal shaped um, kind of like stones that just seem to be naturally fitting together. It's astonishing and it's beautiful. I don't know all the legends associated uh, with it, uh, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, the the with the magic that the children used to create the riverlands and break down off this is the hammer of the waters now when th there's a lot of mystery around this we we often like talk about it as being it's you know clearly a spell that was used but we don't know for sure um if it was one spell or two where exactly it was cast from um was it cast from the Isle of faces was it cast from um like Kaelin in the neck was uh did did the first one work in order to try and uh stop the or create it 
wash away the land bridge, I think that's probably the best way of saying it, between Essos and Westeros. And then the second one did it uh, sort of nearly work and instead create uh, the neck, this kind of flooded area. Uh, there's lots of theories that it might have broken the Iron Islands off from the rest of Westeros. We simply do not know the details because this is back in the mists of time. The best we can kind of understand or guess is that, yes, this was the first time was in order to uh, wash away that uh, land bridge. And the second was an attempt, to, in an attempt to stop the flow of humans coming in. And the second was an attempt to cut off the north from the south of Westeros. Um, I would be fascinated to hear the legends about the Giant's Causeway, by the way, but uh, yeah, I have to admit, I don't know them uh, off the top of my head, and I wouldn't wish to give you half uh, a, a legend. Um, uh, Pierre Davis saying, what's the favourite story or myth concerning the Riverlands? Um, oh, interesting one. Um mm -mm. I don't know about um, myths. The, the the myths, it's it's interesting. That most of the myths, because we get the myths and legends told to us predominantly by people like Old Man. Uh, but in terms of the sort of the river, I think it has to be the the stories connected with the Isle of Faces because. Um, I mean, if you're looking at this map, this is um, the, the biggest lake in Westeros with a massive island in the middle of it. And people just don't know what's there. People just have not been. Some people have tried to get to it, but they just haven't managed to do it. It is clearly magical. Um, we do have legends there of the green men who are protecting it, who have these antlers and things like that. Um, but we don't know, and this is deliberate. And and the the more frustrating thing is we know it's important, uh, not just historically because this is where things like the pact were signed, um, but. Um, when George R. R. Martin thought he was only writing three books, then he mentioned the Isle of Faces quite a few times in the first half of book one, thinking in terms of pacing, he had to introduce this subject because he would very soon be getting to be introducing it in book three. But it, the story expanded. And so he just stopped talking about it. And we don't get much information about it. I would love if we get in one of the forthcoming uh, things from from George R. R. Martin, I say things, I mean it very broadly, um, we're, we're getting, obviously we've got House of the Dragon, um, uh, which will be going to Harren Hall in season two. Um, are we going to be able to see cross from Harren Hall to um, the Isle of Faces? Adam Valarion in the Dance of the Dragons lands his dragon on the Isle of Faces. Are we going to see that happen? Um, similarly, we have the stage play that George R. R. Martin has been in, involved with, which is basically the Tony at Harrenhal stage play. It's going to be called The Iron Throne, we think. But that is going to include, presumably, Howland Reed, who arrives there from the Isle of Faces. Do we learn some more there? So I am excited by this possibility that we might get a little bit more information in one way or another. He he basically um he's he's teased us with not much. The when Adam Valarion did land on the Isle of Faces, we're not told about what it was, and he flies on from there. Basically, he goes to Tumbleton, fights in a war, fights in the battle, and dies. And so we don't even know why he went there we don't know what happened um we don't know if that he would left with any information we don't know anything so yeah that all of the kind of the mystery and the mythology and the stories around the isle of faces i think i would probably um i'd probably count that as uh, the the most intriguing one um uh, 
I think that's me uh, caught up in the chat. Uh, let's go to some questions from my patrons. Uh, King's Road saying, G'day Robert, g'day to you. Why has the Riverlands historically been such a soft target for either being conquered by, say, the Iron Islanders or more often just decimated? The answer here is simple. It's just the geography. It, it's just that they are in the middle. And if there's any wide conflict, it spills over into the Riverlands. And there's no natural defensive terrain in dawn they hide in the mountains under the in the desert they they can do that there's nowhere really in the riverlands that you can hide um, it's fields it's rivers it's there's a few sort of gentle hill hilly areas um but it's nothing there's no mountainous regions those are around the outside so um yeah it's it's geography is the real problem um, Sarah A saying, hi, Robert, silly question, but do you think House Went had the bat as a sigil before they took the seat of Harrenhal, or was it a reflection of their home? Okay, so House Went, as I say, are the family at the start of A Song of Ice and Fire. They are the family who are in charge of Harrenhal, which, although River Run is a sort of the Titular head of uh, the, the Riverlands, this is uh, the biggest castle, the most significant place, I would probably say, uh, since the Targaryens arrived. Uh, House Went had a bat on a background, I think it's um, uh, a white, um, or in fact, they had several bats, I think it was, um, on a yellow background. Now, a nine, perhaps, bats. Now, the immediate, their immediate predecessors, House Lothston, had also had a bat. Now, the question is, did House went, um, were, were, did they coincidentally have the same kind of sigil, or, or did they take that on as a sort of a trying to show some kind of continuity? Is there a connection here with Harren Hall? I think the answer is no, it's not a connection specifically with Harren Hall. I don't think it's, this isn't the, the symbol of Harren Hall being a bat and they thought that, well, we'll take that so everyone knows we've got Harren Hall. That doesn't seem to be it. Nor does it seem to be a particular desire to be associated with House, House Lost and we'll get onto them in a little bit. Um, but it's fair to say that they were pretty hated by the end of it, House Lothston. Um, so House Went, having got Harrenhal, if anything, would wish to distance themselves from that. However, they had, House Went had been, um, as far as we can tell, sort of like a servant house to a House Lothston in some way. And I think there's every likelihood that they uh, they they had the same ish sigil as House Lostan because they were linked. Whether it was like from a bastard uh, child of of someone in House Lostan or something, we do not know the details. Uh, but I think that as we've got two houses who are very local to each other with the same sigil, that doesn't seem to be based on. Um, you know, a, a picture of where they're from or something like that, then that's because one of them was um, gained that from the other. Um, the Bazman. Do you think the rivalry between the Blackwoods and the Brackens has an important role in the story, or is it just a nice world, a nice world building detail for the readers to enjoy? I think it's a bit of both, uh, to be honest. I mean, if if the question is um, whether this is going to be a, a hugely significant thing in terms of the backstory that will play into the denouement of A Song of Ice and Fire, I think the answer is no. But the rivalry, rivalry between those two houses has played out across history and has had many impacts. Uh, it plays out in the Dance of the Dragons. Um, it played out 
in the time of Aegon the Fourth, uh, but with rival houses trying to gain influence in court. It played out hugely significantly in um, the Blackfire rebellions that don't forget, we get the Blackfires, basically they, um, they come from uh, the Brackens uh, or the Agor rivers there. It comes from the Brackens and he was really the driving force and Blood Raven came, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, they came from Blackwood, and Blood Raven came from uh, House Blackwood, and it was that rivalry between Agor Rivers and Blood Raven, um, Brynden Rivers, that that was the heart of it, and that was Bracken versus Blackwood. So, uh, is this in? Is this important or will it be hugely important in the final ending of everything in A Song of Ice and Fire? I don't think so. But the rivalry has had a huge impact, not just in terms of like fighting over small bits of land in the Riverlands, but it had a huge impact much wider in the sort of the geopolitical world of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, uh, uh, April May saying it's important the Brackens of the Blackwoods because it was the Ironborn who poisoned the tree and set and set the Brackens up. Interesting. Uh, it's entirely possible. Um, uh, let's go to uh, a question from Matthew Hawkins. Do you envisage Seaguard being a location that George R. R. Martin takes us to in the winds of winter? Maybe an attack by the Ironborn? I just want to clarify that I am. Uh, I just want to add to that I'm currently listening to Ted Williams' Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn series, which is absolutely brilliant, and I'm really enjoying it. Well, um, just to pick off that last point, uh, it, it's been a while since I've, I've read Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, but I agree, it's it's absolutely excellent as high fantasy goes, and also there are a lot of um, crossovers, inspirations uh, between that and A Song of Ice and Fire that I'm sure you are already starting to pick up on as you go through that. Um, it's it's the series, um, along with uh, Robin Hobbs' uh, Farseer trilogy, that I would hold up as being probably the, the, the series that has the most crossover with what George R. Martin seems to be doing uh, with A Song of Ice and Fire. So, Seaguard. Um, right, let's go to back to the map on this one. So, Seaguard is here, right in the middle of the, the map now. On the coast, on the west coast, um, nearly the most northerly, the Twins are a bit north of this, um, but it it's on the coast of Iron Man's Bay, and the next place you get when you're sailing west is the Iron Islands. Now, is this going to be playing a part in the, um, or, or are we going to see this in the uh, the Winds of Winter? I, I think in order to answer this, you have to work out how, or you have to understand how George R. Martin is writing this story. He is obviously telling it through POV characters. Um, and so, if we're wanting to know if we're going to see something, it's not a matter of is such and such a place important, it's is a POV character naturally going to go there or be there for some reason. So, for example, Casterly Rock has been hugely important through the first five books of this series, but we've never actually been there. We've never actually seen it. We may well do see uh, we may well see castle rock in the winds of winter i think that the hints are very clearly there um and i think george martin has actually uh, suggested it um at some point but seaguard you have to ask why would a character be going there and the reason why you might go to seaguard is in order to get somewhere else. Basically, um, Seaguard in and of itself is not a central part of this story yet. Maybe it will be, who knows, but it's not. It, th there are a lot of interesting things have happened there. Uh, most recently, Rob um, has sent people over to 
Seaguard. Um, the will has gone almost certainly it went to Seaguard and people have headed up north to the wall to let John know they don't seem to have got there yet let not John know that he is in fact um, uh, now the heir to Rob um, so uh, that's why it's potentially important at the moment uh, they have given up the Malisters who own Seaguard, sea guards. it's their place uh, they have given up to the phrase um, this was basically what happened a lot of the time. The Freys held um, one of the Malisters after the Red Wedding and basically said, we'll kill him unless you bend the knee. And they were forced to. So that's um, that's where, it's, that, where they're at. They're loyal uh, to uh, Rob and the North, um, but they have been forced to bend the knee to the um, the phrase. How we might see it is if we get, for example, um, it being freed. One of the, I think one of the big themes, and, and spoiler alert for a, a video I've got uh, that I'm, I'm working on, I'm not sure when it will come out, um, uh, I'm working on a video setting out what I think is going to be in the prologue to the Winds of Winter. Because we've had a couple of clues from George R. R. Martin, and I think, particularly having been doing this series in the Riverlands, and unpicked a few of the, the storylines that we've got going on, I think we can now say with a, a, a not certainty, not anywhere near certainty, but with a, a, a strong educated guess, roughly what's going to be happening in that uh, prologue. Now, because it is going to be set in the Riverlands, very probably. And that's going to be setting things up because the prologue, whatever else it does, sets things up for the book. And one of the things that that's going to be setting up is the Riverlands plot, which in the Winds of Winter is basically uh, the the Lannisters and the Freys losing out. Uh, um, there are now lots of different groups going on in the Riverlands. We've got the Brotherhood Without Banners under Lady Stoneheart. We've got uh, the Super Pack of Wolves with uh, Nymeria at their head. We've got Brynden Tully, Brynden the Blackfish. We've got the the, the Garrison from River Run um, out there. Lots of these different groups who all have an interest in retaking the um, the Riverlands. Um, the, the Lannisters currently have it. The Lannisters are going to implode in the Winds of Winter is my general assessment. Um, so uh, as part of that, Seaguard may well be one of the places that falls or is returned back. Uh, the Lannisters and the phrase kicked out. So might we see that? Um, it's possible. We have a couple of POVs in there at the moment, Jamie and Brienne. Um, we also have Arya, who we sometimes see things when she's walking, sleepwalking into Nymeria. So it's possible. Um, I don't think it's been set up as being one of the main places, though. Uh, agree we're worth saying check ofs wolf pack yeah this is something that george r. r martin has specifically said um uh, when he was asked about this is to say is to call it check uh super pack of wolves um which for those who are unaware of the this is a, a literary truism i guess uh, attributed to Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the, the great writer who said um, that if you place a gun above the mantelpiece and draw attention to it in Act 1, then by the end of Act 5, somebody has to have used that gun. If you set things up in order for the story to be satisfying, you have to give a payoff for that setup. And George R. R. Martin basically has said, this super pack of wolves, it's mentioned again and again and again, and it's getting bigger and it's doing more things. It, it's going to have a role. <laughs> Don't you worry. We can't create this super pack of wolves and then just like stop talking about it. So 
the super pack of wolves will definitely be uh, in very, um, uh, important uh, when we get to, to the winds of winter. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Whitney. Is Sir Duncan the Tall a descendant of House Strong? Possibly, um, I think is the answer to this. The uh, we we often look at it um, from the perspective of who are the descendants of Sir Duncan the Tall. Um, we've got a few very clear and strong candidates in the story, but where he comes from is fascinating because he just kind of appears in in King's Landing in Flea Bottom. And he's clearly taller than anybody else of his age. He stands out in a crowd and he gets picked out by Sir Arlen of Pennytree to be his squire, which is in and of itself, it's a little bit odd. Yes, maybe you see, oh, well, that's a, a fine strapping young lad, but do you wish to then... Uh, trust them, take them out of Flea Bottom and say, right now you're my squire. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't quite, it's, there's something about it that doesn't quite hang true. So there's a, there's a mystery to Dunk's background uh, that I hope we will start to get explained in future Dunk and Egg stories. Um, but might he be a descendant from How Strong? Uh, it's possible. I think I've got a question a bit later about, um, uh, Sir Lucamore, uh, Lucamore Strong, who um, was around in the reign of King Jaehaerys the uh, First. So he was a member of the King's Guard, and then it was discovered he became later he became known as Lucamore the Lusty because it it was then discovered that if you're a member of the King's Guard, you're supposed to. Uh, like being in the Night's Watch, take no wife, etc., etc. It turns out that he actually had three wives, none of whom knew about each other, and no fewer than 16 children in various parts of King's Landing. So uh, what happened? Well, the, the women were sort of like distributed to various places, but we have the children, 16 children. We're not told what, what happened to all of these children. Um, it's entirely possible that some of them may have settled down in King's Landing and therefore Dunk, who will have been born, oh, I, don't, I don't know exactly when, but now a century or, or so later, um, he perhaps was the descendant there. That kind of adds up. And um, yeah, he, he is tall and he is strong and that fits. That any we often get these descriptions of being tall and strong, and so we we know that using strong as a descriptor is often um, a hint that perhaps maybe that should actually be their surname. Um, so it's possible; it's, it's entirely possible. I don't think we've got the information yet. Um, let's uh, Terra Incognita saying Dunk is just dunk yes um so it's i mean i I, th I probably did a video on this at some point um and i suspect i'll, I'll expand this out a little bit more as well but i have said on, on a number of occasions there is something about dunk that is magically non-magical he is um in the language of um, the Wheel of Time, something akin to a Tarveron. Fate just seems to swirl around. I'm going on a digression here about Dunk, but I, I find this fascinating. Um, fate seems to kind of swirl around him. He seems to stumble into places, um, not have the foggiest idea what's going on, why, but it just he just happens to be there while hugely important things happen around him. And uh, so he turns up um, at a tourney and he jumps in to save what he thinks of as a damsel in distress. Turns out that the person attacking her is a, a Targaryen. One thing leads to another. 
um, and the heir to the throne dies because of Dunk, and he's there going, why? And it's an entirely valid question. Is there some kind of fate going on here? And that, you might think, is okay. That's just, it was a cool story. Um, but then later on, he and Egg decide to go to another tourney. Uh, they head up to White Walls, and then they suddenly discover that they're in the middle of the second Blackfire Rebellion, which is being plotted there. And you get when Bloodraven, sort of, who... It's probably there through the story that that's a, a digression too far to get into that. But he's there to dunk. It's just like, why are you here? <laughs> what, what? How? How is this possible? Uh, you just stumbled in. This seems too, too random that you just like stumbled into this. But you did. Um, so, uh, and and when he was younger, dunk remembers uh, Blood Raven who didn't know who he was at all at the time, it would appear just turning and staring at him as he came into King's Landing. Um, and it's just all of these things about Dunk just seem to, fate just seems to swirl around him. Um, so anyway, that's a complete digression into Sir Duncan at all. There's something going on there uh, that we haven't yet got uh, all of the uh, the details about. Uh, Andrew Kay saying Dunk has some Heracles vibes, obviously big and strong, and has that habit of charging in with influential results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. We would put a link in the chat if you're watching live saying Joe Magician has a cool house strong playlist. Yeah, absolutely. If Joe Magician were here, then I suspect, I mean, if I say his name three times, maybe he would turn up, but uh, I, I suspect he, um, uh, he would probably be able to give you all of the links as to why uh, Dunk may well be uh, from House Strong. Uh, let's go to a question from Max Kingdom saying, hello, Robert. Hi there. Is, my question involves the ruins of Old Stone. In your opinion, why do you think a castle so heavily tied with the rulership of the Riverlands through House Mud, who united much of the region as petty kings, was abandoned to ruin by following uh, by following river kings such as House Justman and Teague? Since it predated the construction of Harrenhal, it seems like the closest thing the Riverlands had to a seat of rulership. Would it not have been in the interest of the succeeding river kings to claim rulership of the seat of the previous kings as a mark of legitimacy? Um, as far as we can tell, it wasn't even granted as a reward to a vassal and was left empty until the small folk started to take uh, much of the stonework. It seems like a huge waste of a valuable resource to me. Yes, um, I understand this, um, and it, your, your points make complete sense. However, I think... I think it also makes complete sense from a kind of a historical perspective for it to have been left to ruin. Now, what I mean by this is this was House Mud and House Mud were deposed by these Andal kings. And would the Andal kings uh, want somebody to be setting themselves up again as... Um, the the new the successes to house mud well no so it probably wasn't in their interest to let people um to let people uh, sort of reoccupy it um the andal as i said the andal invasion wasn't we shouldn't think of it as an invasion so much as the immigration and it worked by intermarriage so each of these new and andal petty kings actually took over lands of places, you know, other families, House Bracken, for example, intermarried with House Bracken. And they were then uh, in their interests of, of making um, House Bracken and the lands on Stonehenge, all of that area around there, that be the centre of things. Uh, so I can understand completely. This does seem to be a, an element of deliberate... Uh, neglect to start with because the name has been lost and most of these names in Westeros they seem to I mean I think this is one of the few examples we've got of we don't know what the original name of this place was 
but it's now called this. Um, this does seem almost deliberate to just let it go, to let it be just a memory of the past. It, in terms of the small folk taking the stones, this is very common. But there's a hundred, a thousand examples of this in pretty much anywhere, and certainly in England, but Western Europe, Eastern Europe, a lot of places with a history of old stone buildings that the people would, when they were abandoned for a while, people would just take those stones and build other stuff with it, because why wouldn't you? So I think all you have to do is leave it for a generation, and then it it would be too much effort to start up again. So I think that if you take it from that just very in-world perspective, it kind of makes sense. Added to which, it's it's a bit out of the way. Um, let's do the map again, because I'm enjoying doing the map. Um, uh, oh, I've still got it up. <laughs> so uh, we've got um, the, to remind you, Old Stones is uh, there. Um, See, we have Seaguard to the north. Uh, right, the twins is just off the top there. Uh, the twins didn't exist at the time. Seaguard did exist, um, but most of the towns uh, were further south. So, if you wanted to stake a claim, if you wanted a a place that you were going to build a castle to rule the Riverlands, having it all the way up there. Uh, old stones probably wasn't the best idea. This is why when Harren the Black came in, he thought, I'll build it at Harren Hall, because it was central, because it was um, uh, the a place where everybody could get to, which is why things like great councils and tourneys and things happened at Harren Hall, because it, they were, uh, it was just a very central location and if you were wanting to build somewhere you would do it there rather than be somewhere all the way to the north um so a quick flick through the chat um i think I'm, i think i'm caught up largely here Greek Weirwood saying it was a first man stronghold and the Andals would want to destroy the power base of the old gods' families until they were established. Uh, yeah, you've said that much more succinctly than I managed, uh, so I think that's right. Uh, very much so. The, the Andals wouldn't want to be setting up a base in around the um, old stones, this very... Um, old godsy kind of place it's it's worth remembering that at this time there was an active policy by the andals to be chopping down weirwood trees so would they be wanting to set up home somewhere like that i don't think so let's go to a question from um king of imps saying uh, hey robert we welcome to the princess of imps into the world on december the 19th so i haven't had much brain power for questions uh but i've kept up with the streams on many sleepless nights i'm pretty sure the young lady likes the sound of your voice well thank you for so much first of all congratulations uh it's wonderful news um uh you did i think mention it uh b beforehand at the, at the end of last year that this was going to happen but um i'm so happy uh and i hope that that uh uh, that she is a blessing to you, um, as I'm sure she will be. Um, so you had a question, which is, can you give a brief um, uh, summary of the extinct royal houses of the Riverlands, Mud, Teague, and Justman, and how they impacted on Westerosi history? Uh, yeah, I've sort of done a lot of this already, actually. I was picking up on it, but I'll, I'll sort of do the, the high-level thing. So... Mud's House Mud were the last of the first men kings of uh, the Riverlands, and and when I say the Riverlands, I'm still using this as shorthand. It, the I think their kingdom was called the Rivers and the Hills, or something like that. The exact name of what the kingdom was for the Riverlands did change quite a lot, but they were the last, um, and they lasted for. A thousand years or so until we have Christopher the Fourth, who lost his hundredth battle uh, against the Andals and died, and then his son tragically wasn't quite as successful. 
as him and died before he reached his hundredth battle um, and House Mud were destroyed. After that, we get this period of um, uh, lots of petty kings going on before House Justman, who is, th this was founded by a bastard, uh, a love child from houses Blackwood and Bracken, uh, who unify, doesn't unify the houses, but manages to uh, rule over the Riverlands, and it would appear, appear reasonably successfully. For about 300 years, House Justman lasted. Um, then we get House Teague, who were really not loved at all. Um, they, um, they seem not to have been good overlords, but also they were quite keen on the getting rid of the old gods thing. And so House Blackwood led, along with a few other houses, a resistance to them. And uh, apparently it seems that there was, you know, this wasn't an untroubled rule. Um, they lost, you know, they, they faced uprisings quite a lot of the time, but eventually House Blackwood invited House Durandon, this incredibly powerful house from right, the Stormlands right down at the bottom end, uh, further out, the next kingdom along after the Riverlands to the southeast. I basically invited them to come in and kick out the Teagues. Some deal was, it would appear, agreed. House Durandon would claim a bit of the Riverlands and the southeast of the Riverlands. And legend has it, they would have made the Blackwoods the kings of the Riverlands. But tragically, the Lord of the Blackwoods died during the war that followed. Um, the, the Teagues were defeated, and then House Durandon thought, well, we might as well rule here as well then. And they just built their um, kingdom and extended it out so it was the Stormlands and the Riverlands. And again, people didn't necessarily much like them, but it was better than House Teague. Uh, and so they hung around for a long time until uh, House Hoare come in and take over. So that's the the headline of that. Um, but you also asked... Um, for a rundown of all the houses who ruled Harrenhal, uh, who ruled Harrenhal and their importance to the world. Okay, so this is a this is quite a fun list. Um, and at the end of this, I would love to know. I'll I'll do a I'll do a short video on this at some point because it's fascinating. Is there a curse of Harrenhal? I'm going to go through the people who have ruled Harrenhal. It's been around for, let's not forget, 300 years. Um, and compare this to your average across Westeros for a big castle. Uh, Winterfell has only ever really had the Starks. Uh, Storm's End, they've had two. They had the Durandons and then the Baratheons. Um, Castley Rock, they've they've had the two, the Castleys and the Lannisters. Um, Highgarden just had the two. So it's quite uh, it, it, to be expected. A big castle will have only one family ruling over them, or maybe two, um, for centuries, millennia even. But this is the list that we have for Harren Hall. First of all, we have House Hall. We know about House Hall. Um, Harren the Black, uh, his pride was so strong, uh, and that was what led to his downfall. And um, after House Hall, this was given to, and Harren Hall, it was a massive castle. And the Although the rulership of the Riverlands, effectively, Lord Paramount of the Riverlands, went to House Tully, whoever was going to be in House in uh, Harren Hall, they had huge lands attached to it, massive castle. They would be hugely important and influential. And this was given to um, uh, a guy called uh, Quentin Coheris. Now, Quentin Coheris came from Dragonstone. He came across with uh, the Targaryens. He'd been master of, master of arms in uh, Dragonstone, which basically meant that he trained the Targaryens to fight. 
they trusted him completely, it would appear, and put him in charge of House um, of, of, of Harrenhal. Uh, now, there are rumours that perhaps this was even a Valyrian household, which kind of makes sense. Um, the name sounds a bit Valyrian-y, Coheris, that definitely sounds, you know, Daenerys, Coheris, that kind of thing. Um, and they were on Dragonstone and they were loyal, uh, so it's entirely possible. However, um, they then uh, only survived for a few years until um, we get Aenys the First, Aegon's son, um, who wasn't very good at holding on to power. And during his time, there was a revolt by uh, Harren the Red. So this is another of the Iron Islanders who came in um, and attacked and killed the Caheris. House Caheris was no more. Um, it was then given to um, Lord Haraway. Now, Lord Haraway, his daughter, Alice, then became the second wife of um, Magor, Magor the Cruel. This was the wife that uh, that forced him into exile because he was already married, and um, but he didn't have any children. He wanted children. He had he took another wife. This was Alice Haraway, and so suddenly the Haraways in charge of Harrenhal. Uh, Lord Haraway's town, town, incidentally, is just close, very close to uh, to Harren Hall. It's the, you know, the, they had the town named after them, um, but they basically got this huge upgrade. Now, that all came crashing down when she, Alice Haraway, was accused of having an affair. Uh, she gave birth to what I think was described as a monstrosity in the way that Targaryens sometimes do have um, children that are um, a bit dragony, let's say. Um, and uh, Tiana of the Tower, who was soon to become wife number three, um, she uh, basically accused um, Alice Haraway of uh, adultery. Magor was not a very um, understanding man, uh, nor particularly inquisitive. He accepted this and he killed every Haraway he could find, just wiped them off the map. Everyone who was a Haraway was gone. This is the end of House Haraway. So this is now the third house in you know, half a century or so. House Hoare, House uh, Carreras, House Haraway. He then decided, Magor decided he did want somebody in Harren Hall after all. Uh, so he set up a mini tourney. He, he got his, his best knights and said, right, fight each other. Whoever survives, they, they get, <laughs> they get Harren Hall, which on one level makes sense, I suppose, that you want Harren Hall to be held by a strong uh, fighter, but uh, actually just just ended up the whole load of his supporters fighting each other, most of them dying. In, indeed, uh, Lord Walton Towers was the person who won, and he, uh, although he won, he died just a few days later from the wounds that he sustained in that battle. So his family, House Towers, then had Harrenhal. But uh, they weren't given all of it, the, as in not all of the lands. Some of the lands were taken from them. And when uh, House Towers remained loyal to Magor almost right up to the very end, and although they did bend the knee to Jaehaerys, when Jaehaerys came in, they lost even more lands. And so under the House, House Towers, Harrenhal started to turn away from being this astonishing castle with huge rich lands to a massive castle that you can't quite sustain because you haven't got the lands and the income to sustain it. The uh, house towers dwindled down to just one small one one person left um, 
called Magor, incidentally, um, who was sickly, we're told, not well. Um, and in this huge castle, uh, at which point Reina Targaryen, who has got a huge and tr tragic history, read about her in, in Fire and Blood, um, but she was another one of these wives, a forced wife of, uh, of, of Magor. And she seems to have, at the end of this long, tragic story that she has, uh, she doesn't want to go to King's Landing. She doesn't want to go to any of the places where she's got ghosts. She, she calls them history there. Um, she decides that she just wants to retire somewhere, basically. And she seems to get this affinity with this last remaining member of House Towers, who she has a link with obviously through Magor and she takes up one of the towers the widow's tower and she just stays there and she lives out the rest of her life the house towers dies out and she stays on living out that and she basically rules the um the Harren Hall for the next 10 20 years um and nobody challenges that she's a Targaryen um she's um She's got a dragon there as well. It's not just like her. She's it's just this Dreamfire, I think, is the dragon that is is there. Um, and so she stays there until she dies. When she dies, um uh, we then get how strong who take over. Now, how strong this is again, this is a bit of a, a reward for them, uh, for being loyal. They're allowed in. They they actually they survive for quite quite a while um and rise in power we have you'll have seen them in house of the dragon lionel strong the lord uh, there he became hand of the king harwin strong he um became almost certainly the the lover of rhaenyra um father of some of her children laris became master of whispers um they gained great power however um that Lionel and Harwin both died in a tragic fire. Laris was killed at the um, spoilers. Uh, Laris was killed at the end of uh, the Dance of the Dragons, and then suddenly it's up for grabs again. But there is somebody again, as with Reyna Targaryen. There is somebody who's living there and basically claims it. That person is Alice Rivers. Now, Alice Rivers, I am so looking forward to seeing in House of the Dragon Season 2. She will appear in House of the Dragon Season 2. Um, I think I've got questions on her, so I'm not going to get into huge amounts of detail here and now. I'll talk about that a bit later. She, uh, we don't know how old she was, probably in her 40s, but she apparently was a magic user. And maybe some people said she was even older than that. And... Uh, after the end of uh, the Dance of the Dragons, she basically says she's uh, she's pregnant with uh, the son of Aemond Targaryen, and uh, this is Aemond One Eye Targaryen. Uh, so she says that she's got his baby, um, and she basically claims Harrenhal for her own. She sends this. Um, emissary to King's Landing to to say uh, okay anyone I, you have to just accept that Harrenhal is mine now if anyone approaches they have to um, bend the knee straight away um, leave us alone um, and if anyone laughs at this messenger then he will die Somebody did laugh, and the messenger, we're told in Fire and Blood, the messenger immediately started choking, and it looked as if there was a, the imprint of a woman's hand on his throat, kind of like a force choke kind of thing is the, the idea that of, of what the imagery is here. What happened to her? We don't know. 20 years uh, seems to have been potentially up to 20 years uh, she was there. Um, but this is one of those things that was at the end of Fire and Blood. It was kind of like left as a bit of a cliffhanger. This is clearly a threat to the Targaryen reign. What are they going to do about it? Um, Aegon III has now come to power fully. Um, what's he going to do about Alice Rivers? 
who is Alice Rivers? Who is this child? Is the child who she says it is? Lots of questions left unanswered. And we're not told uh, a Fire and Blood story finishes there. We're not told in the world of Ice and Fire. And we haven't had any hints elsewhere in A Song of Ice and Fire uh, about what happens. So that's a mystery. However, um, 20 years or so later, uh, House Lothston get uh, get to take it. It's, it's empty at this time. House Lothston um, get put in place there. They stay there for about 60 years, I think. Uh, so they're actually there for a while. But again, people don't quite like them. They seem to not be very good. And the Maesters never like a woman <laughs> who's magical. Uh, and uh, she gets quite a bad write-up in the world of ice and fire. And she's known as Mad Donnell Lothston, um, this last of the Lothstons. Um, and all manner of terrible things are ascribed to her. Um, I think I would just briefly say that we shouldn't take this necessarily at face value. She seems potentially to have some kind of link to Blood Raven, uh, another magic user who was around at this time. She is there. If you the third Duncan Egg story, when an, an army arrives to help support Blood Raven, she is there. We're told that she is there, um, and so she seems ready to answer the call from Blood Raven. However. Um, whatever it will, the bad things that they do, eventually um, it's it's decided that, that um, House Lothston must fall, and they do. We don't know all the ins and outs, but part of this is House Went, and House Went are rewarded by being given Harren Hall. House Went are there, and uh, they hold it up until the beginning of A Song of Ice and Fire. They are Oswald Went is probably the most famous of the Wents. He is a member of the Kingsguard, one of the three who ends up at the Tower of Joy. Clearly an ally of Rhaegar in some way, which makes the tourney at Harrenhal all the more suspicious because this was set up, therefore, by allies of Rhaegar. Now, a couple of very quick mentions after that. Um, who gets given it? We get... Um, a series of people who sort of have ownership of it for a while. Tywin is there for a while. Um, Bruce Bolton is there for a while. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think who else. Uh, the Brave Companions hold it for a little while. Um, the Mountain holds it for a little while. Um, so we get a few people, but the person who then gets given it, awarded it, is Janos Slint. Um, for services rendered in the capture of um, Ned Stark, basically. And so he is made Lord of Harrenhal, but then he is stripped of his title and he gets sent up to the wall and obviously um, Jon Snow eventually kills him. Um, after that, it gets given to Peter Baelish, um, who at the moment hasn't had a uh, an unhappy end, but, you know, there's still time. So, anyway, there, there we have it. We have House Hall, House Coheris, House Haraway, House Towers, uh, Raina Targaryen, House Strong, um, Alice Rivers, House Lothston, House Went, House Slint, House Baelish. Just in this 300 years, the turnover here is huge. The, the rumours are about this curse. Everybody knows this curse of Harrenhal, added to which it looks itself quite haunted because of the stone, like the melted stone, but it's also dark and blackened, uh, the stonework. Um, and it's even if you put half an army in there, it feels half empty. Uh, so it feels like there's ghosts and, and it's half abandoned. Um, added to which... In order to build it, apparently, uh, Harren the Black ordered weirwood trees to be cut down and their wood to be used, which perhaps the children of the forest weren't very, very keen on. Uh, so there's lots of these rumours about there being a possible curse. But let me have, have a quick flick through the chat if you've got thoughts on whether there actually is a curse or uh, if there isn't and it's just like a 
an urban myth in Westeros. Um, uh, reflective rambling saying, uh, don't sound that happy about Baelish ending there. Um, you may end up saying something mean. Um, something mean, I, I, I think... Uh, well, I think we're probably allowed to say something mean about uh, about Littlefinger, and uh, yes, I think that we will probably all cheer if he does meet some kind of tragic end. Uh, the goat says April May. Yeah, he was there as well. Um, Andrew K saying definitely seems like a curse to me. Uh, not like houses go extinct left, right, and centre, and many houses who rule Harren Hall are literally wiped out yeah it's worth pointing out that it's these houses are not just uh fall on bad times they're, they're just completely wiped out how strong has gone there's no more how strong as far as we can tell house went has gone there's no more house lost and um uh house whore have gone house caheris have gone house haraway have gone house towers have gone these are just houses that have disappeared they've been wiped off the face of the earth that it seems a lot um, uh, let's have a quick flick through. Um, Amon says, My personal opinion is there is no curse on Harren Hall, rather, it's just a series of coincidences surrounding the fall of the ruling houses. Um, Agree, weirwood saying maybe that's how Sweet Robin will meet his end. Sweet Robin dying at Harren Hall that would be horrific. It's noticeable that Littlefinger, although he he doesn't, um, I mean, he he sort of scoffs a little bit about this idea that there's a curse. He also very obviously says, but I'm not going to go there and claim it. He doesn't go there at all. He may technically be the Lord of Harren Hall, but he's not going to go and claim it. Um, Chas saw saying, I think the curse is the location, um, guaranteed, guaranteed to be in every major conflict. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Andrew Kay saying, Weirwood's destroyed slave labor. Uh, yes, and uh, massive excess on the shores of the magical hub of the realm. No surprise that Harren Hall is cursed. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so. Uh, Mr. Wumbo saying, I think early on it was just luck. Then as time went on, it became uh, give someone this thing as a reward, knowing that it's garbage, so you're not giving up much, uh, like Euron with the islands. Um, yes, I mean, I think that also kind of makes sense. I mean, my, I, I love this idea that there is a curse. I, I do love this idea that there is a curse connected in with the, uh, the use of weirwood, uh, weirwoods and this is on the shores of the god's eye lake um and so it's not like this is just something the children forest could turn a blind eye to they can see from the from the isle of faces they can see this so i do like this idea i think that it's got beyond just coincidence for me um but i think it's probably going to end up being one of those things that george R. R. martin he's not going to spell out for us but he'll just let us see. <laughs> um, and uh, he's, he's a big fan of magic remaining mysterious. He doesn't want us to know all the ins and outs. He, he doesn't want us, well, doesn't want to say, this is a curse because of X and Y, and then these people did uh, A and B. Uh, that means that there's a curse, and the clauses of this curse are, you yeah. know, G H and I. He, he doesn't like that. Uh, he's the, sort of like the, he's in the soft magic category rather than the Brandon Sanderson hard magic category, where everything is very clear about how magic works. He wants the air of mystery, and he thinks that is what makes magic feel magical. So I suspect, although yes, it looks like it, we're never going to be told for certain one way or the other. Uh, uh, smoke screens in the chat. Hi there, smoke screen. Uh, great to see you. Uh, the curse is the weirwood that was used, like the weirwood thrown in the eerie. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I get that completely. For those who don't know, uh, smoke screen, uh, another channel that covers 
uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, uh, and much more these days as well. So do please do go and uh, join my chat too. So please do go and check him out. Um, uh, great to see you. Um, also written uh, a, a really good uh, fantasy novel that... Uh, it's on my bookshelf somewhere. It's just over there, just out of reach, I'm afraid. Uh, otherwise, I would show you called The Crimson Gods. Um, Kaya Spellerina saying, uh, since House Bigglestone is named after one of George R. R. Martin's friends, have they ever done anything interesting? I don't even know their sigil. No, I don't think we do know their sigil. Um, and, no, I mean, this is something George R. R. Martin does a lot. Um, is just drops in um just nods to either to writers that he likes um or in jokes for him and his friends um so for example there's um up at the wall you get one one uh who's the name that's the name of a uh, one of the giants now I'm not an American football fan, so this may make more sense to American football fans than it does to me. But apparently, one one is presumably eleven is the number of uh, a, a particular um, uh, football player, um, and there's some kind of link across to Patrick Mellister, who is up there and gets killed by one one. So um, he likes doing this kind of in joke that doesn't affect the story in any way, um, but um it's it's amusing to him and and fair play to him i don't mind that at all uh but no house Biddle, bigglestone uh, no huge um uh sort of backstory history to them just a, a fun little thing um richard johnson um saying large castles in the middle of contested lands tend not to last very long but even then this seems cursy yeah i mean i think that's ge generally um uh the the kind of feel i think most people get from it it feels cursy but we haven't got the, the absolute proof of this um mara lee picking up on this uh talking about house baelish saying currently littlefinger is lord of the riverlands and house frey um is under attack by lady stoneheart and the brotherhood without banners in the riverlands does Littlefinger know this? Does he know that Lady Stoneheart is actually Lady Catelyn Stark, seeking revenge for the wrongs done to her family? If so, what do you think he'll do about it, especially since he has her daughter Sansa? Um, will Sansa find out about Lady Stoneheart? Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, I think the short answer at the moment is that Littlefinger does not at the moment. He will he will know about the Brotherhood without banners, Um and he may have caught uh, the whispers, uh, although the, the area is quite cut off, um, it has to be said. But he will almost certainly have caught the whispers that they're under new management and they're actively hunting down the Freys and the Lannisters. That kind of thing um, will have filtered through to him. Will he know that this is Lady Stoneheart is Catelyn Stark? No. This is still a, a big mystery. The, the number of people who know this is starting to expand, it has to be said. So we get Brienne now knows about it and Pod. Jamie is going to come and almost certainly he's gone with Brienne, has gone to get him and brought him back to face her uh, and the series of charges she will almost certainly put in front of him. He will then soon know. So this secret is going to get out at some point soon. But at the moment, um, no, he does not know. Uh, my my instinct, though, his his plan is that yes, he is the Lord of the Riverlands, and Sansa also has a sort of a, I mean, a claim to the Riverlands is probably putting it too far, but she uh, she is a tally on her mother's side, so there's a link across there. Um, my instinct is that his plan is to secure. He's most of the way there. Secure the veil. Um, keep the idea of the Riverlands in his back pocket, and then when he realizes the fact that uh, when the the coup attempt against the Starks has failed, when the Boltons and the Freys um, lose, as I think that they will in the first half of the Winds of Winter, and then suddenly we get the claimants, the Stark claimants coming, he will start thinking. 
this is the chance. This is when Sansa can come in and claim the North. As far as he's concerned, as far as anyone's concerned, Rob Stark is dead. Rob Stark did not have any children. Bran Stark is dead. Rickon Stark is dead. Ne uh, Jon Snow is a bastard. Who is next in line? Sansa. As far as he's concerned, that's with the situation. So he is going to go with Sansa in some way and try and get control over the North. That probably does not mean going through uh, the Riverlands. I think that he wants to steer as far clear as uh, the Riverlands as possible. You can get a boat, get up to White Harbour, and then work your way up to Winterfell from there. So I think that's the more likely route. So um, that's not me saying that Lady Stoneheart will never come into contact with um, Littlefinger or Sansa, but I don't think it's going to happen uh, swiftly. And I don't think it's going to happen um, probably not in the Winds of Winter. If she survives, then perhaps a Dream of Spring. Um DM Collins saying, I'm still a little or a lot confused about how Littlefinger thinks that he can reveal Sansa as Sansa without now becoming an enemy of all claimants to the Iron Throne. Um, well, uh, I, I think that he's... In his mind, there there is a what he he's, he explains this. I, I don't know if I can uh, find the the quote. Um, just let me see if I can. Um, he does explain the the plan um, to Sansa. Here we go. Um, he says, uh, "I had hoped to have." four or five quiet years to plant some seeds and allow some fruits to ripen. Uh, but now it is a good thing that I thrive on chaos. What little peace and order the five kings left us will not long survive the three queens, I fear. Three queens? She did not understand. Um, and then this is this is the plan that he's basically um, uh, got here. He will... Um, he, he send, says, you know, I, I've made a marriage contract for you. And she says, but I can't because I'm already married. And he says, we can work our way out of that. Um, and then he sort of goes on and basically says, um, uh, at the end here, um, when Robert dies, this is sweet Robin. He says, when Robert dies, um, uh, our Poor, brave, sweet Robin is such a sickly boy, it is only a matter of time. When Robert dies, Harry the heir becomes Lord Harold, defender of the Vale and Lord of the Eyrie. John Arryn's bannerman will never love me, nor our silly shaking Robert, but they will love their young falcon. And when they come together for his wedding, and you come out, because the plan is to marry her to the heir... Uh, Harry the heir, and when you come out with your long auburn hair clad in a maiden's cloak of white and grey with a direwolf emblazoned on the back, why every knight in the vale will pledge his sword to win you back your birthright. So, those are your gifts from me, my sweet Sansa. Harry, the Eyrie, and Winterfell. So, that's the plan. That's that's his plan, is that, uh, or at least his plan as he explains this to um, Sansa, is that he's going to uh, marry her off to the heir, to the Vale. Uh, so she's then sort of married in uh, to that. He can stay Lord Protector. Um, and then uh, everyone's going to say, well, she's the heir to the North, and she's now our great lady here of the Eyrie and the Vale, and we will go North and claim her homeland back for her. That is... As we understand it at the moment, that is his plan. So, how are they going? How is this not going to annoy all the claimants to the Iron Throne? Well, the claimants to the Iron Throne, uh, he's basically abandoning the Lannisters. He sees the writing on the wall for the Lannisters, and he's almost certainly right. Um, uh, when new people come invading Fagon, Danny in time, they will just see the status quo rather than what happened over the 
last while. Um, and the other pretender to the Iron Throne, um, well, the other pretenders to the Iron Throne, uh, Renly is dead. Stannis is way up north. Um, and uh, the other kings, Rob is dead and Balon is dead. So um, that's how he sees this. Um, and he just thinks basically we'll just go in and claim it. Curtis Bellerin is saying, are houses Lolliston and Lothston related? Not that I'm aware of, uh, but that doesn't mean that they aren't. George R. R. Martin creates a lot of how a lot of houses, and he doesn't give us the family trees for those houses. So we, I mean, I'd love to be able to answer questions like that, but I uh, don't know. Uh, Martin S. saying, evening, Robert. Hi there. Um, I forgot about this live stream, but saw it is on. Anyway, I'm here now. Welcome. Uh, I hope last week, uh, whatever cause of no live stream was great for you. Yes, it was actually. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know I did. I, I sort of announced that I wasn't having one, and I didn't uh, didn't give a reason. It was it was for good reasons, not bad reasons. So uh, so don't worry. I'm all is well here. Um, but thank you for uh, caring. Um, uh, that actually means quite a lot to me. Um, uh, so I will try and make sure that I flag these things up uh, a bit more in advance in the future, so nobody gets concerned. Um, Let's go to uh, Lady Pushkins uh, saying, Hi, Robert. Won't be there tonight. Uh, I hope you're having a, a good time, though. I think you said you're at work uh, and you're going to watch this uh, later. Um, uh, so hello to you in the future. Uh, you are time traveling. Um, great segue there. That was unintentional. Um, which period in A Song of Ice and Fire are you landing in and why? Um, so if I'm in the if I'm time traveling in a song of ice and fire, I think the diff the 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 important distinction here is: am I going somewhere to live? Um, in which case, I'm going to go to one of the longest and safest periods of history, uh, maybe under the rule of Jaehaerys the first, and then Viserys. Um, that's probably where there was the least problems, and I'd go somewhere down in the reach, somewhere nice. High Garden or Old Town or something. Um, but if I'm just going to see what's uh, see what's going on and what happened, I would love to go to the Tony at Harren Hall. Um, that there's, I'm just obsessed with finding out what happens with that. Um, uh, right, the uh, as I'm roughly halfway through, what I try and do. Uh, is say my thanks to people um so first of all uh, if you're here watching live uh, and you're in the chat then could you just say a quick thank you to the moderators the moderators do a fantastic job um uh, it's keeps this a very um uplifting safe place for people to be and i hugely value that um so if if you're there in the chat could you just show the moderators a little bit of love i would very much appreciate that. Um, in terms of um, patrons, I also want to say thank you to, this is how I get to do what I do, how I have the time to do what I'm doing, researching stuff, getting the videos out for you is because of your support patrons. So that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. If you do want to support the channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon. There is a link down in the description. Um, in terms of um, upcoming videos, just to, uh, while I'm on the off the top of my head, and having said that, oh, I can't remember what I've got. Oh, I thought I'd do one just, uh, um, sometimes people quite appreciate this, just explaining a few little questions from early on in the series that maybe you haven't quite got clear in your mind. So who killed John Aaron and why? Um, what's the detail about that? Because this is actually, um, if it's been a while, it took three books for the reveal. This is one of the big opening mysteries of the whole thing. Um, and this drove so much action. Um, and it was only really at the very end of book three that we got final conclusion on exactly what happened and why. Um, and I think that there are some implications of that for the uh, for the future as well. Um, uh, the story that will impact on the story in the last two books as well. Uh, so I've got that coming up. Um, and uh, what have I got? Oh, The Well Told Tale. That's the other thing I'll talk about. So The Well Told Tale, if you do not know, I've got another channel um, where I read audiobooks, um, basically. Uh, 
classic science fiction and fantasy stories. I've um, it's just a passion of mine. I, I love sharing the best stories that there are in science fiction and fantasy um we've just finished it's available as a podcast as well if you prefer that uh, but it's a youtube channel on the youtube channel we've just finished dracula so if you missed out on that then um it's all uploaded now if you're waiting for the end then now you can go back if you want to look back through the back catalog we've got war of the worlds we've got conan we've got call of cthulhu we've got Gran and Poe, we got there's so much stuff on there. Um, fantastic stories. Um, and we've got uh, a few. Um, I think next up we've got some Paul Anderson, the classic sci fi, some more Conan, love the Conan, and then in I don't know, two or three weeks' time, we will be starting 1984. So if you've never actually read the book and just want to know what the hype is about why everybody keeps on talking about it why everybody keeps on uh quoting it um 1984 will be happening over on the well-told tale in the next couple of weeks um andrew k asking when i'm going to start doing the this week in geekdom news vids yeah i was intending to do it this week um i'll try and do it i'll try and do it. i've got a bit of time next week so i will try and do that next week um for those who don't know what that is, um, just very briefly, what I sometimes used to do uh, at the front, at the top of these live streams was just uh, things happening in uh, the you know, the wider fantasy world, books coming out, uh, films, TV shows, um, George R. R. Martin's latest blog post, whatever. Um, uh, and some people like that. Um, and so I decided, though, because I know with these people, uh, often watch them back days weeks later uh, it's not quite up to date by the way hello if you are watching this uh, or listening to this back uh, a long time after the date that i've recorded it um uh, i thank you for for watching this much later uh, but i will do short form videos uh, doing that i will just very briefly say now i did watch june 2 over the weekend june 2 well worth the hype um it is as good as people say um right all of that um uh done um let's dig back into some of these questions uh mr worldwide saying my liege lord robert thank you uh is it possible that alice rivers was one of luke or the lusty's bastards um also do you think she could have been a green seer she was likely of first men descent and lived her life so near to the isle of faces i've wondered about the possibility that she'd visited with the green men and honed her abilities there okay um, so we've introduced the characters of Alice Rivers and Luca Moore, the Lusty, um, already. To remind you, Luca Moore, the Lusty, Luca Moore Strong, um, was uh, he had he was a member of the King's Guard, but rather naughtily had three wives, none of whom knew about each other, incidentally, uh, and sixteen children. Um, he was found out, and he got sent up to the ball. Um, we don't know what happened to his children. Um, Alice Rivers is a magic user who appears in Harren Hall um, during, well, she was there a bit before that as well, but during the Dance of the Dragons. Now, just in terms of timing, uh, Lucamore Strong was around uh, his... Uh, his dirty doings were discovered in the year 73 AC uh, after the conquest. Uh, Alice Rivers, uh, when we get to the end of the Dance of the Dragons, that's the year 131 AC. So this is nearly 60 years difference. Now, she was, we're told, 40 years old, but um, looked a lot younger. And everyone said this is because of the magic. And the rumours were that maybe she was even older than 40 years. So could she be 60 years old, which is roughly what she'd need to be here? It's possible. Could she be one of his his bastards? Yes, entirely possible. We know one of his wives was sent up back up to Harrenhal. Uh, so it's possible. Um this make her a first man descent? Yes, uh, potentially. Uh, does this mean that she grew up close to the Isle of Faces? Yes. Um, 
might she therefore have visited with the green men and honed her abilities there? It's possible we don't have any information on that. And the, I think the um, the thing that I would say is that that there's no hints that that is what this is. As in all of the magic that we see her do, we hear that she she can see things in the flames. Uh, we hear about this kind of like. Uh, remote force choke thing that she seems to be doing. These are not. These are not kind of the green seer things. She, the green seers don't look in the flames. That's a Brelaw thing, as far as we can tell. Um, we also haven't heard them do that kind of force choke thing. That's you know they get green dreams. They can do the warging. That kind of thing. So it doesn't feel like it. Now the intriguing possibility is that she may be a bit of both in the sense that we get blood raven who seems to have merged the targaryen magic side with uh, his green seeing side so we see he clearly grows into the green seeing side becomes a tree wizard up north of the wall um even in his younger days we hear rumors about his walking and things like that but also, he seems to be using uh, glamour magic with a ruby and things like that, um, and other types of divination. So he seems to be on a wide range of magic. George R. R. Martin, I, I think he's, as we've already said, he's got quite a soft magic system. I don't think he has got such clearly delineated types of magic. Um, yes, we can see, certainly see the types of magic that green seers use and that doesn't seem to be what this is but what type of magic she therefore uses is a little bit open to question so a slightly roundabout way of saying it's possible that she could have been a green seer but uh green seers tend to get their visions through weirwood trees and through dreams as opposed to seeing things in the flames which we're told was what she did um Caris Bellarina, what happened to Aegon III's Butterwell bastards? Did they have to be recognised to be legitimised? What happened to Butterwell's dragon egg? Um, uh, right, so the Butterwell bastards, um, I think that was Aegon IV, uh, where we're talking here. Um, uh, so he allegedly, almost certainly, um, uh, had I mean he had mistresses all over the place, but Lord Butterwell's daughters were um, uh, some of what he would probably consider his playthings, um, and they had bastard children. What happened to them? We don't know. He seems to have had lots of bastard children. We don't hear about all of them. That this is one of the big, big mysteries that we actually have um, from this period is that all of these people with. Valyrian heritage, we just do not know. Blood Raven had two sisters. We don't hear about them at all. Um, Blood Raven is clearly hugely powerful, but what about his sisters? They're just not mentioned. Um, so there, there's a lot, uh, particularly after Aegon the Fourth. There's a lot of these uh, Targaryen bastards just wandering around, and we do not have the information. Uh, Butwell's Dragon Egg, we do have a bit of information about this. Uh, so, basically, the the story is that uh, Aegon the Fourth gave Lord Butterwell a dragon egg in order to sleep with his daughters. That's the, the the basic story. Anyway, Lord Butterwell had a dragon egg, and this was being used as the prize, ostensibly for uh, the tourney at White Walls, which was a cover for planning a second Blackfire rebellion, uh, which we read about in. The Mystery Knight, the third Duncan Egg story. So that's all the, the long background. Um, this uh, egg gets stolen. Now, Dunk sees it um, and he does, or he egg really talks to um, Blood Raven about this. Where, where did it go? What happened to the dragon egg? Dragon eggs, obviously, hugely important to the Targaryens in particular, uh, but incredibly valuable for anyone um and the implication 
is that it got stolen. Uh, Blood Raven had hired a, a troop of dwarf dwarf acrobats, um, and they kind of climbed up uh, one of the uh, the chimneys into the room with the egg, stole it, um, and then gave it to Blood Raven. Now, this kind of makes sense. Blood Raven was there; he would have known about this dragon egg, and Targaryens are obsessed with dragons, and he will have wanted to get the dragon egg back. So, this all kind of makes sense. What happened to it? Well, we don't know. What we do know is that by the time of Aegon the Fifth, so this is Egg. By the time of Aegon the Fifth, as king, he had seven dragon eggs. Now, there were a few. He already had one. Apparently, we're told he was randomly talking to Dunk about it at one point. He said, "Yeah, I've got a dragon egg. It was put in my uh, in my cock, my cradle when I was a child. Never hatched." Um, he wants to hatch these dragon eggs. He's, he's got seven of them. So my best guess is that that was brought back into House Targaryen. And then when Egg was king, he used all of the ones that he could to try and hatch them at Summerhall with tragic consequences. Um... <laughs> Carl Karsnark saying, force choke the like and subscribe buttons. Uh, yeah, I mean, that. Uh, okay, let's get it. Um, uh, Rhoda, Rhoda Leader saying, I'm going to see June 2 at the weekend, so thanks for the recommendation. Um, uh, and love to the mods as well. Excellent. Yeah, I, I do recommend the uh, June 2. Um, it looks, e even if you don't like the action of the story, it looks beautiful. Uh, I think Denis Villeneuve is... Um, uh, not just with the June stories, but so much of what he's done. The uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine looks astonishing. He's he's got a gift. It has to be said. The cinematography is amazing. Uh, Martin S uh, saying, if you had an opportunity to game master a tabletop role playing campaign in any era in George R. R. Martin's world or in any era in Tolkien's world, uh, what would the time and place be? Well, I can't choose between the two. Um, uh, I think Tolkien's world very quickly, I think I would go all the, all the way back to the first age. I think it would be a fantastic um, period to um, after Morgoth's forces have broken free and are starting to rampage south. And you're there trying to survive. Uh, time seems to be running out. Um, that kind of thing, I think, would work really well as a, as a sort of a tabletop role-playing set, um, uh, setting. In terms of George R. Martin's world, I would love to run one in Bravos. There's so many levels going on there. The politics are going on there. Um, the assassinations, um, the... Um, the different parts of town with lots of different cultures coming up. You've got the theatre world that we've got going on there. You've got the um, the whole uh, courtesans world. You've got this uh, the water dancers world. So much uh, sort of fascinating ideas for adventure there. Um, Callie Summers saying, Hi, Robert. Been a rough year in life, but you're a point of stability. Oh, thank you. That, that means I hope I hope 2024 improves for you. Um, uh, and I'm very happy to be able to play a small part in that. Um, Lord of the Rings question. Uh, yeah, okay, we can do, we do that. I want to, I've not finished yet on the Riverlands question, so we'll get back to that, but happy to quickly answer this one. Uh, what if Saruman had waited one more year? Um, he'd have been invited to Rivendell and the ring would have gone via Isengard, right? Um, if he, I mean, I don't think he could. It's, I think this is one of those ones where you can't um, say, you know, what if he'd waited one more year? Um, he, uh, like everyone else, started to sense what was going on and he knew that the time was then right. Um, the uh, the Black Riders came via him. I mean, this is sort of off camera, 
before the, a lot of the main plot kicks in. The Black Riders came via him um, hunting for Baggins in the Shire. Um, and he knew that Gandalf liked the sh liked the Shire. Um, uh, he knew that the Black Riders would only be coming all the way out there uh, on a secret mission if they got a real big clue. He he pit figured it all out. Uh, he couldn't wait. Um, the the ring was on the move, um, and he had spies in the Shire anyway, and around in um, Bree. So. Yeah, I, I think I, this is one of those things that uh, he couldn't wait one more year. Um, and I suspect, though I can't say for certain, that um, he, if he had managed to persuade the council that he was still on their side, um, I still think that Elrond and Gandalf between them would have sensed something wrong about sending it via Isengard. Um, Andrew Kay saying, I've always found it somewhat odd that none of the great bastards took the Targaryen name. This is like Wind and Rivers and, and the like. Um, Damon and Aegor, it makes sense as rival claimants, but why not the others? Well, some of them may have done. Uh, as I say, we don't, we simply don't know about Blood Raven sisters, uh, but basically the the big four seem to have liked nicknames. Um, it's like an individuality thing. Bitter Steel, I am Bitter Steel, I am Blood Raven. Um, they accepted these for them. Shira Sea Star. Um, so it's like it's almost like they they wanted their own identity, which was connected to Targaryens, but slightly independent from it. Um, at that time, the I, I think certainly if, if if Bloodraven had renamed himself Brynden Targaryen, then people might have seen that as a threat to the throne, which I think he at the time he was very keen not to appear to be, because it might look as if he's saying, I'm a Targaryen, I'm running the Seven Kingdoms already as Hand of the King, I should be king. Uh, DM Collins, what is the craziest tinfoil theory you actually believe is true, despite not many other creators and fans believing in it? Um, I get asked this a lot. I don't think I believe in many crazy uh, tinfoil theories, to be honest. I think most of my theories are quite um, uh, straightforward. I, at least I try to make them be like that. Um I mean, I think probably the one that f the fewest other creators and fans would sort of immediately subscribe to is the idea that the statues in the Winterfell crypts will come to life. Uh, probably the Horn of Winter will bring them to life. I've got a whole load of logic to back that up, um, uh, but... Uh, I, th I think that that's probably something that, um, I mean, quite a few minded people, I'm sure, agree with me, but um, uh, it's not something that I think is necessarily as mainstream as most of my other uh, thought processes. Right. Um, let's go back to some questions from my patrons. Cranag Woman saying, Hi, Robert. Um, hi there. Uh, why do you think there was such a rift between Hostetelli and his brother Brynden? There, there was definitely a rift between them. Uh, they argued. Brynden uh, headed off to uh, the Vale with Lysa Tully when she married um, John Arryn, and he basically abandoned his family there uh, and went to serve the Arryns. Uh, why was this, given the fact that he's clearly, from what we see of him, he's clearly very focused in on his family and his care for his family, uh, why the rift? And and I see no reason to go beyond what we've been told, which is that Hosta had set up a marriage for his brother. Hosta, let's not forget, Hosta Tully was uh, very focused on getting good matches and marriages for his family um 
he got Lysa and Kat engaged to and then married to um, lords of top tier noble houses. Um, he was central to this big extended um, alliance marriage pact that was being forged between the north, the riverlands, the vale, the stormlands. Um, they were at the center of it. And he arranged not just one, but several possible marriages for the Blackfish. And Blackfish said no every time. And that caused a uh, that that was what caused the rift, and I think it's as simple as that. Now we can you can obviously go one step further and say why did he say no? We're not told. Um, I think some people say maybe he's gay. Um, my instinct is probably more likely that he's just a romantic or asexual or something along those lines because we don't hear of him getting any other attachments. Um, in fact, one thing that was very noticeable when I was last reading my way through book one of Game of Thrones, when um, when Kat gets to the, the Eyrie and she basically says, yeah, she tries to get Lysa on side and Lysa saying, no, well, we're not going anywhere. Everyone here is we're going to stay here and not get involved in this war. And then uh, the Blackfish says, oh, yeah, OK, I'll come with you back and help out the family. And although we don't <laughs> don't follow his POV around, it's very clear that he just like packed his bags and was gone the next day. He, he wasn't there saying, oh, I just really need to, uh, just there's a couple of people I need to say goodbye to first. Um, uh, I need to be able to come back here because he doesn't do that. So he's clearly not made any really close friends in all those years, his 15 years or whatever it is over in the Vale. He's not made any close friends that are close enough that he um, that he doesn't feel he can just go. Um, so I think that's just who he is. And if Hosta was pushing him to get married and he didn't want to do it, and he's a very independent-minded person, then that that would cause a rift. Uh, Andrew Kay saying everyone wants to get away from uh, Hosta. Yeah, I kind of understand that. Um, uh, okay, let's go to Moon, a question from Moon. After Arya sets Nymeria free in the Riverlands, Nymeria and her wolf pack create a lot of havoc in the Riverlands. They've been hunted a couple of times. However, the wolves always won. Do you think they will be hunted again? And do you think the wolves will survive? And do you think the wolves distinguish between different men? We know that Arya has wolf dreams. Do her dreams influence the actions of the wolves? And is she able to unconsciously shape the events in the Riverlands? Okay, a lot of questions all around this. Um, but fascinating stuff. We've mentioned the super pack already. We've mentioned the fact that this is Chekhov's super pack of wolves. Um, it will have a purpose. But first of all, let's pick off the Arya points. Um, when... Uh, I had Aziz on here a couple of weeks ago. We were talking through book three, um, and we got asked a question about Arya and her sort of control in her walking into Nymeria. And I think we both came to the conclusion that although this may well be changing, most of the time, certainly for the first three books of this series, um, she's had no training. And she just thinks that these are wolfy dreams. Um, she just goes along for the ride. She uh, she thinks you know, she she sleeps, uh, dreams about being a wolf, and then wakes up, uh, and it's like it was just an incredibly vivid dream. And no one's ever sort of taken her to one side and said, you know, that's probably you know, that's probably your um, skin changing bond with your dire wolf. Um, Maybe what you can do in those times is you can, um, you know, you can try and steer Nymeria to be doing one thing or another, or maybe you could try and do it when you're not asleep. Um, nothing, she's never had that. So at the moment, she is not directing events. This is Nymeria doing things, and Aya is along for the ride. That may or may not change in the future. Um, but uh, will. 
will the super PAC get caught? I, th I think the the time where people have got the spare time and resources to be going and hunting wolves is is pretty past in this story. Now, now the super PAC is big enough that they're the threat. They're the ones going out to hunt for things. And it is noticeable if you look, they get mentions, odd mentions again and again and again through these books. And they do seem to be, other than a few random, uh, oh, there was like uh, killing a farmer and his sheep. Apart from that, in terms of the soldiers, they do seem to be attacking um, wagon trains of the Lannisters, uh, some frays. Uh, they're not actually attacking the Brotherhood without banners. They're not attacking uh, random uh, northerners or um, tullies uh, out in the Riverlands. They do appear to be picking where they're going. And when... Nymeria finds um, Cat Stark or Cat Stark's body and brings it, pulls it out of the river. Then this does seem to be there's this, um, and I can't um, uh, remember the exact phrasing, but this there is this kind of sense of uh, Nymeria knows who this is. Yeah, come hunt with us, rise again. Uh, that's the feel um, that it's uh, so Nymeria can tell because Nymeria is linked to Arya and Nymeria is linked to the other direwolves. So, um, yes, the wolves themselves probably know, but they are being led by Nymeria and Nymeria does know. Um, Kirsty Angel, Quinn, the GM, a Song of Ice and Fire content creator, wants to do a and d slash a Song of Ice and Fire parallel stream, but wants someone who knows the law really well. Carl suggested you. Would you be willing and able to guest on his channel for it? I mean, I don't know the, the law of the um, Dungeons and Dragons as well. It has to be said. Um, I, I have to admit, I don't... I don't don't think I know Quinn. I think this is a different Quinn to um, uh, Quinn's ideas, isn't it? Um, it's been a while since I've been watching <laughs> other people's channels. It has to be said. Um, by all means, uh, ask them to get in contact. Um, I'm happy to talk through stuff. I'm probably not the best person, but um, I'm always happy to, to chat to people. Um, uh, thank you for passing that on. Um, and Carl, you're just saying no pressure, but Quinn and Haven are great lads, and in real world, in, in real life, D and D folks. Quinn is a DM, and Haven lives in England as well. Okay, I don't, I don't I have to say, I, I don't think I've met them before. I don't know Haven, um, but uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be fantastic too. Um, uh, okay, let's go to a question from um, Riley Jack. Thompson, just doing my first read through of all the books. Um, I'm halfway through Clash and I'm loving loving it. The story is really heating up, um, but I can't uh, help but feel a little bad for the Riverlands, though the pace uh, because the place is almost in a non-stop war. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm fantastic. I'm I'm very jealous um, that you're you're reading through for the first time. Um, uh, it's well worth a reread, but that's <laughs> that's in the future. Um, I'm, I'm, it may, makes my heart warm to know that you're reading them and enjoying them. Um, but feeling a bit bad for the Rivlands, uh, though the place is almost in a non-stop war. Yes, but it, it is, and you see that um, in in book two, A Clash of Kings. You see that through Arya wandering through the Riverlands. Um, what you will find. Uh, without spoilers, but it's the, what you will find is that you get this again in the next book, and then again in the book after that, you get Jamie and then Brienne both spending time going through the Riverlands, and you see this land that is just becoming devastated, and it's becoming more and more horrific the, the, long, the longer the war drags on, and so yeah, definitely feel sorry for them. 
Um, Catherine Furseth saying, Hi, Robert, I'm fascinated by House Malister and their story. Uh, on the surface, they seem like just any other second level Riverland house, but it struck me that they seem to pop up in the story at very unexpected times. Uh, for example, what is the reason for their assumed close bond with the North? Uh, Jeffrey Malister was one of Brandon Stark's companions who was killed by the Mad Kings. Dennis Malister is one of the most respected commanders in the Night's Watch. Um, they aside from Rob in the war against the Lannisters, etc. Is this just a coincidence or is there a reason for their connection to the North? Um, also, what does their motto above the rest tell us about their house? Um, well, above the rest, I, I mean, I it probably just shows a little bit of arrogance would be my best guess um there's also uh let's go to the map again for this one um uh, let's let's just have a quick show round here so they are here right slap bang in the middle here on the um the coast that's sea guard now you'll see first of all they're quite far north in the riverlands um they are there's only the twins further north of them so above the rest if you're looking on a map may, maybe if we're if we're trying to go with the they're not just arrogant people um then uh perhaps that's what it is um the second thing the link with the north they are to the north and it's worth pointing out if I'm just sort of scrolling up a little bit. The North is big is the first thing to point out. Uh, the North is very big. But if you are somewhere on the west coast of the North, if you're on Bear Island, there's Deepwood Mott up there. You can come down. Uh, Barrowton is there just on the river um, uh, leading to the coast. Flint's Finger. Any of those places on the western side of the North. If you're going to be doing trading or if you're going to be getting stuff down to the south, Seaguard is the first place south of the neck you come to. And in order to get from Seaguard even further down, Casterly Rock is there now in the middle. Um, there, In order to do that, you have to go past those islands, the Iron Islands, which you may not wish to do. So... Um, what's the first link with the north anything on the western side of the north by sea transport almost certainly will be stopping off at sea guard um so there is a natural link um in there between uh the house malister and the north um as as for the sort of the specific examples um you've got here so Jeffrey Malister was one of Brandon Stark's companions. This is a really interesting one. So um, Brandon Stark, if you remember back to the build up to Robert's Rebellion, uh, Brandon Stark, when he gets all very angry and he decides that Rhaegar has um, abducted Lyanna and he goes charging down to King's Landing, he doesn't go on his own. He goes down there with four, I think off the top of my head, companions. And uh, it's quite a an eclectic mix. Um, he's got, there's a Glover, one of his squire is a Glover, so somebody from the north, but also the heir to the Vale of Arryn, um, someone from House Royce, and also a Malister, um, Geoffrey Malister, as we have here, who we think probably was the heir to um, Seagod. Now, why that random selection of people? Well, they they appear to be friends or something like that but you do have to remember that this brandon we think of him just as being like this hothead but actually he seems to have been a central part in his father's plans these southern ambitions to be um forming alliances south of the neck so what's happened with the the starks well ned got sent to the eerie to be fostered in the eerie um where robert baratheon also was that's where that strong link came from brandon had been engaged to um uh, cat tully so that's a riverlands connection coming up there um and brandon seems to be trying to build alliances out of the north uh the malisters 
a sensible and logical place to start. House Royce, if you're in the Vale, a sensible and logical place to start. House Royce is um, First Men House. They have links up to the wall. Waymar Royce, you remember one of the very first characters we come across, Waymar Royce is from House Royce. The, the voices are sympathetic towards the North. Um, John Aaron's heir, he's got the link there with... Uh, through Ned. So these it may appear a slightly eclectic choice, but actually if you just go into it with this idea that he is there trying to make political connections in the South, then this this makes sense. Um, Dennis Mellister being uh, on the Night's Watch um, is... I mean, is this a coincidence? Again, this is like one of those houses. It's in, in the North... Um, not in the north, north, but in the north of the rest of Westeros. And Dennis Malister, who is he's a West Watch, uh, so he's at the western end of the wall, and he's been there for a long time. Um, he is the um, brother, or he was the brother to the the Lord of uh, Lord Malister. So, what were his choices? He could either um, be married off to somebody or he go to the wall and he chose the wall um and he does seem to be quite as a character he does seem to be quite ambitious he definitely seems to want to be lord commander so it's entirely possible given the fact that this isn't like in the last few years when going to the wall seems to be really not something you would want to do um but when he was younger Maybe he he just had he, that was just the thing he wanted to do. Just go to the wall and become Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. It's entirely possible. Now, so and then siding with Rob in the war against Lannis says yes. I mean, everybody in basically the Riverlands Lords did that. Is there a reason? So is it a coincidence? Is there a reason for their connection to the North? I, I think it's not a coincidence, but it fits with a house that more than, other than probably the phrase, um, more than any other house in the Riverlands looks to the north uh, because they have to have links to the north. Um, question from uh, Reflective Rambling. Uh, oh, picking up a question for Jervis Germain. Thank you so much. I love it when people do this. Um, how have the Riverlands managed to be independent at all? Surprised they haven't been torn up permanently and become borders? Um, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question. The I, th I think the answer is probably that the the kingdoms around them had natural borders. So there is a natural border in the north, the Neck. And so House Stark, having gained control of all of the north, they didn't really want to come south. That wasn't until we till we get to Rickard Stark that there's not really much interest in the south from the uh, from House Stark. Yeah, occasionally they have to engage with it. Um, Craig and Stark in the Dance of the Dragons, um, uh, Torren Stark when Aegon the Conqueror invades so sometimes they have to engage with the south but actively looking to the south to expand their area no that's not really their thing um similarly the vale of arin has got this massive mountain range they're very happy in the land that they have that offers them good security um the and the westlands is also the case um, other places who don't have that kind of natural um, boundary have tried to take over and annex the Riverlands, it has to be said. The Stormlands have, the Iron Islands have. Um, we, we get a bit less from the Reach, it has to be said, but generally speaking, those other areas have tried to sort of take bits of the middle. Um, but the issue is that there's always somebody else there trying to push back at you so it's um we're just where we are now um the riverlands if you get out of the mindset of the riverlands it has always been that 
area with those borders and go, well, okay, sometime there was a point at which the southeast of that was definitely owned by House Durandon from the Stormlands. There's there's a point at which some of the bits uh, uh, in the middle were taken by the Iron Islands. And once you start to get into that idea, it's just this is just the, the, when the Targaryens took over, the boundaries became calcified, and the uh, who is in charge gets set. Uh, so the last 300 years, things have not changed because the Targaryens have set them in in stone. That's the, what they are now. Um, let's go to uh, Commander Ray. Uh, what about the land itself of the Riverlands that is so enticing to rule? It seems to be well positioned and rivers serve as great highways, but beyond the rivers themselves, the land isn't very defendable. And while farming is going to be very productive, there seems to be so much going against the Riverlands. Yeah, um, there is a lot going against the Riverlands in terms of sort of defenses which is why it's interesting that you get something like river run the castle it's it is as defendable as it is because of the rivers because they basically built it in the middle of, of two the confluence of two rivers and they've sort of set up this system where they can actually start to route the river around the castle so it's quite hard to get at it um so what is it about the Riverlands that people want? I mean, for most of the people who are there, it's just to, because it's their land. That's where they are. And they, they don't stop and think about, oh, well, maybe this isn't the most geographically enticing place. It's, this is their land. This is where their mothers, fathers, grandparents lived. Um, House Malister want to live around Seaguard because that's where House Malister have always lived. Um, the the Brackens want to live around their area because that's where they've always lived, and and so on and so forth. This is, I, I think, we can we can try and look at it abstractly, but when you just get down to basic human motivations, people want to live in their where their land where they their ancestors were and things like that obviously things get more complicated uh when these things are disputed um but that's what's enticing is that this was their land um uh <laughs> but I'm Momo saying, I have to say I'm impressed how Robert can focus for hours and put together amazing thoughts while I have to focus on my toast so it doesn't burn. I also have to focus on my toast so it doesn't burn. So do not worry about that. This is, I think they're completely different skill sets, I can assure you. Um, right. I've got two more questions in uh, from my patrons. So now is a good time to drop any more questions into the chat. I'll try and pick them up. Um, Brandy 1842 saying, what do you think about the tinfoil Omni Walder? Um, now, I have to admit, I didn't know what this was. <laughs> um, I had to Google this one uh, as a tinfoil theory. I think this appeared first on Alt Swift X, um, from what I can tell. Um, uh, it might have been Glidus, who I, I, I don't know very well, I have to say, um, came up with this. Um, but it's the idea that um, all of the, in the same way that there's a the theory out there that all of the brand stocks are the same brand stock um, in different points of time, uh, all of the Walder Freys are the same Walder Frey um, it, through some magical means. I think this is a slightly, I, I think this is a slightly tongue in cheek um, tinfoil theory. As I say, I've, I've not. Uh, heard of it before um but um with my non tinfoil hat on it's uh, uh it's a no from me <laughs> at the at the moment I, i'm happy to look into it if, if people would like me to but uh my my instinct is no uh, raven's oath saying um uh hey robert i'm personally very intrigued by house mud ruled the riverlands for over a thousand years but we know next to nothing about them um, do you think that Jenny of Oldstones was the last known descendant of them? Okay, so with Jenny of Oldstones, she was 
uh, she seems to have come from Old Stones. Um, does this mean that she's a descendant of House Mud? Um, I mean, not necessarily. And and I think we do have to sometimes take a step back and say, uh, this a thousand years is a long time. And so to say, I mean, um, that uh, your last known descendant of House Mud is, I guess, the equivalent to me saying I might be the last known descendant of King Ethelbert of Wessex. I mean, it's possible, but it's so far in, in the past that I don't think that that makes huge amounts of difference. Uh, I don't think I am. Uh, he, what, he, was there even a King Ethelbert of Wessex? I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, I hopefully you understand the point, is that this this is such a long time, I don't think that the mud inheritance, if there is any, would be strong enough or relevant enough for this to be making a, a difference to the story, if that makes sense. Um, uh, House mud, though, yeah, it's intriguing. We don't know much about them, but I think that um th they are f for me they're well placed in this that if we knew huge amounts about them i would actually be a bit more suspicious because there should be houses that have just disappeared there should be royal lines that have stopped um this is a well-rounded world that george R. martin has created for us so the um, the fact that there was a thousand, well, many thousands of years ago, lasting for a thousand years, um, a royal family, um, but we don't know huge amounts about them, that seems about right to me, I have to say. Um, I would love to know more about them, uh, but I don't think we will. Uh, Raven's Oath, uh, picking up a question for Callie Summers, thank you. Um, why were the Riverlands so contested compared to the Reach? Both are great places, but one was secure and the other was fought over for centuries. Um, well, interesting question. I mean, I think the first thing is the geography point that I've made a few times. Um, it is in the middle, um, uh, as well as being not mountainous and hilly. Now, the not mountainous or particularly hilly thing also applies to the Reach, but what the Reach had is strong, consistent leadership. Um, there was House Gardener, who were in charge at High Garden for millennia, and House Hightower are perhaps the oldest house in all of Westeros, and they were there overseeing um, Old Town. So I think that that's the first thing. There's a strong... Uh, leadership. I think there's also, um, I mean, I don't, I, it's saying civilization is probably the wrong way of, of putting it, but uh, th an established status quo which had been set up, uh, which benefited most people. Um, now, what that meant in, in the reach was that actually the reach seems a pretty nice place to live um everybody uh knew their role that we had um a city set up which had um the scientists effectively the the maesters we've had the the religious structure set up there um the houses uh, have been in place for a long time um this is set not in stone, but it's it's how it has always been. The Riverlands, um, every time you had a cha change or shift, things reset. You see this in in the Dance of the Dragons, in the Song of Ice and Fire, the War of the Five Kings. Um, you you hear occasionally some people say this is going to set the Riverlands back by a generation, and it is. Is that how will the farmer get back on their feet when their farmhouse has been burned down? Uh, their sons have both been uh, taken off to war and won't return. Um, their pig has been slaughtered. Uh, their crops have been burned. How easy is that for them to get back 
on their feet. It'll take a generation. Um, and that happens again and again and again in the Riverlands. So it's a, a self-sustaining cycle in a good way for the Reach and in a bad way for the Riverlands, if, that's, uh, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Michelle Rymo saying about my uh, flawlessly about the king that the, the, all of the kings of the kings of West, Wessex had names like um, the, there was a Ethelred the Unready. There was um, uh, well Alfred the Great is the of the most famous one, um, but the, a lot of them had names along those lines. So uh, I may have stumbled across a real one, or, or it may have been completely made up. Who knows? Um, Uh, Zach K, do you think it's possible that Ghost the Direwolf is actually a white somehow? He was the runt of the litter, yet opened his red eyes before the other pups and rarely makes a sound. This is Blood Raven magic? Um, so I think Blood Raven is involved. I th the uh, obviously when in doubt, etc. Um, but. Th the, that's through the colouring. The clues are in the colouring. The white fur slash skin and the red eyes that's there but i think that's a clue to the fact that blood raven walks into him um which we see several times is likely um is he a reanimated corpse i see no evidence of it um because uh, when you have the um uh any of these kind of whites in whatever way it is there are physical signs um cold hands has got black cold hands uh beric um he's um he's not breathing he's not eating uh lady stoneheart similar kind of things um it's just like the blood stops pumping there are no signs of this at all. They don't pick up on this and go, well, this is a strange wolf. This wolf is different to the rest because um, he doesn't eat. Uh, no, he does eat. <laughs> he hunts. Uh, he acts like a normal wolf. So I think the answer is no. I like I like the thinking, but I think the answer is no. Um, April, May saying thank you for all the goodness here. Well, thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, uh, Andrew Case saying the Reach also almost always had huge armies and a navy that tends to be well stocked from staying out of a lot. Yeah, this is true. So yeah, the the Reach also. I mean, this is adding to the why why isn't the Reach like the Riverlands? The Reach they did have big armies. The um, the Red Wine Fleet is always mentioned as one of the three big fleets. Um, in the Seven Kingdoms, the others being the Royal Fleet and the Iron Fleet. Um, and they largely kept to themselves. Um, it's fair to say that uh, certainly when you get uh, houses like the High Towers, they, with a couple of obvious exceptions, they don't seem to have ambitions over time to be expanding out, to be ruling huge amounts of the... Uh, of Westeros, they uh, mostly have been happy to stay in Old Town and say, well, this is our area. So the desire there to be owning more lands is simply not there. Um, uh, Kelly Summers saying, it'll take us a generation to rebuild this spoken every five years in the Riverlands. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite tragic. Uh, Caius Ballerina, uh, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. This could mean what she did at Old Stones. Did she live in the ruins? But it could also mean she survived Summerhall for a time and stayed until she died of um, old age. Um, so um, I think that yeah, the, the sort of the implication is that Jenny dancing with the ghosts in Old Stones is yes, this is about Old Stones, but there the echoes of Summer Hall are definitely there. Now I don't think she survived. Um, the, the the very clear implication from 
what the ghost of high heart is bemoaning is that um jenny died at summer hall in as part of the the fire not uh well she survived but she lived on for another 10 to 15 years and eventually she was a bit old i mean she doesn't seem to have been that old to start with um uh, but uh no the, the 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 implication from what the ghost of high heart says is not that jenny survived and it was okay for a bit it was jenny died a horrific death uh Andrew Kay saying certain houses that suddenly become physically huge like the Baratheons and Clegane might be suggestive of, suggestive of strong seed. Um, I suppose so. I mean, the the tinfoil theory about House Clegane is that there is some magical interbreeding um, with things you do not perhaps wish to them to be interbred with um the baratheons it just uh, even if you go right back to the very first baratheon uh that we know of that they seem to have that seems to be the build the broad um uh build so i don't think either of them are um uh, from the strong seed um i mean the, the, there are some intriguing characters who um, you have to s wonder where their sort of height and things come from. Brienne is the obvious example that this comes from Dunk, we think. Um, small Paul at the wall um, also is in At some point, I'll do a short video about this. Um, the people who have that phrase connected with them uh thick as a castle wall um brienne does and small paul does as well i think there's one or two others i'd have to have a look um but uh this seems to be a way that george r martin gets us the link to um uh dunk Um, Zach K saying Mel occasionally, the Melisandre occasionally eats and also might physically age. Maybe white isn't the right idea, but something, just something suspect. The eyes open too early for a pup could just be because he is being walked. Um, yeah, it could be. I think so. Melisandre, I did a video on that actually quite recently about Melisandre. Um, she appears, to, there's something going on there, and I think that the fact that she hardly sleeps if at all she hardly eats and she says that she is sustained by fire she is not sustained by food she is not sustained by sleep um there's something else driving her which means that there's definitely something magical fire white is my best guess uh but i it might be a different thing um uh, right, I think uh, with that, uh, I'll go full screen for the, for once. Um, <coughs> pardon me. I think with that, I'll start to draw this one to a close. Uh, next week, we will do. Um, I think we'll probably try and do a Lord of the Rings. It's been a while since we've done a Lord of the Rings one. But next time we come back to this series, I think we'll head off next to the Vale and have a look at some of the interesting houses we've got going on there. Um, definitely, obviously, we'll look at uh, House Arryn. I really want to look at House Voice. Um, probably also House Corbray. Um, but let me know um, if you watch this back afterwards down in the comments if there's any houses in the... Um, uh, the veil that you're fascinated by that you think it's there's there's enough to talk about for two or three hours for a live stream um then absolutely we'll do that um but uh, if you are um so that'll be next week i'll be back next week if you are looking to see uh, or watch a few more of these live streams there's a link to a playlist appearing somewhere around here um if uh, you would like to support this channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon. There's going to be a link appearing somewhere around here. Um, and I'll also try and remember to put a link somewhere else, maybe in the middle, um, to The Well-Told Tale, if you would like to be um, 
listen to me reading books to you. Dracula's just finished. We're going to be starting 1984 soon. Okay, that's it for this time. Take care, everyone. I'll see you again soon.